Okay, Leanne, I think we're ready to go ahead and get started. All right. I'm here. I'm ready to go. All right. Good morning. I'm Aaron Yao. I'm the designated federal officer for the Clean Air Scientific Advisory Committee. In my role as DFO, I'd like to formally open this public meeting. The KSAC is an independent expert federal advisory committee chartered under the authority of the Federal Advisory Committee Act. The KSAC is empowered under the Clean Air Act to provide independent advice to the EPA administrator on the scientific and technical bases for EPA's national ambient air quality standards. FACA and EPA policy require that KSAC meetings be announced to the public in the Federal Register and that substantive deliberations and interactions with EPA and the public be conducted in open sessions where DFO is present to ensure that the requirements of FACA are met. FACA also requires that public meetings provide an opportunity for public comment. There is a public comment period noted on the agenda. However, there were not any members of the public who requested to make oral comments. Minutes will be prepared to summarize discussions and action items in accordance with the requirements of FACA. I will work with the chair to certify the minutes and have them posted on the KSAC website. The KSAC consists of special government employees appointed by EPA to their positions. As government employees, the members are subject to all applicable ethics laws in implementing regulations. The SAB staff office has determined that advisors participating in this meeting have no financial conflicts of interest or appearance of a loss of impartiality under federal ethics regulations relating to the topic of this meeting. To those watching the live video webcast, please send me an email indicating your attendance. If you had previously requested a call-in number, you do not need to email me again. I'd now like to turn the meeting over to Dr. Leanne Shepard, Chair of the Case Act. Thank you, Aaron, and welcome everyone to this meeting of the KSAC led review panel. Our purpose today, as you well know, is to review our consensus report and letter to the administrator based on our review of the lead integrated science assessment. Because we are finalizing our report, members of the chartered KSAC who are not already on the lead review panel have joined us. Since we have some new individuals join us, uh, we will begin with panel member introductions. Uh, since we have no public commenters to spe uh, speak today, then I will turn the meeting over to Steve Dutton so EPA can ask for some clarifications. Uh, then our del deliberations will follow and we will start with the consensus comments uh, going uh, section by section or page by page, depending on the specific content. Uh, we've also received comments from a few members which have been posted on the web. We will be sure to address these in public as well. As you are well aware, uh, we need to deliberate any changes to this report in public. That said, there is no need to mention minor edits and wordsmithing type of changes. Please email those to me and Aaron. So now I'll turn to the panel and then uh, and charter KSAC member introductions. I'll go through each panelist in alphabetical order, uh, with the starting with the lead panel and then moving to the remaining charter KSAC members who are joining the panel today. So for so first of all, I'll introduce myself. I'm Leanne Shepard. I'm a professor, a Roman Haas endowed professor at the University of Washington School of Public Health and trained as a biostatistician. Uh, first up, uh, members of the panel, is George Allen. Good morning, everyone. George Allen, Chief Scientist at NESCOM in Boston. I'm a former Chartered KSAC member during the previous lead review and a member of several KSAC panels since 2004. My expertise is in measurement methods, aerosol science, and exposure assessment. Thank you, George. Uh, next up is Charter KSAC member Jim Boylan. Hi, good morning, everyone. Jim Boylan, Chief of the Air Protection Branch at Georgia Environmental Protection Division. My uh, background is in air quality modeling, monitoring, and implementation of the NACs. Thank you. Thank you. Next up is Charter KSAC member Judy Chow. Hi, I'm Judy Chow, research professor at the, the Division of Atmospheric Science of Desert Research Institute, part of Nevada System Higher Education. My research interest has been in uh, uh, monitoring network design, air quality measurement, and uh, data analysis. 
Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is uh, Deborah Corey Schlechter. Good morning. This is Deborah Corey Schlechter. I am a professor of uh, environmental medicine, pediatrics, neuroscience, and public health sciences at the University of Rochester Medical School. Um, my research over the past 10 or so years has been on the effects of air pollution on both brain development and uh, on brain aging and neurodegenerative disease. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next up is Charter KSAC member, Christina Fuller. Good morning. Um, I'm Christina Fuller. I'm an associate professor at the College of Engineering at the University of Georgia. And I specialize in exposure assessments, epidemiology, and environmental justice. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, Phil Godrum. Good morning, uh, Phil Goodrum here. I'm a principal toxicologist with GSI Environmental. Uh, I also am a professor at the State University of New York College of Environmental Science and Forestry, um, where I teach a course of environmental risk assessment. Uh, my expertise is in uh, exposure assessment, toxicology, and the use of mechanistic models in risk management decision-making. Thank you. Uh, next is Perry Gottsfeld. Good morning. I'm Perry Gottesfeld, the Executive Director of Occupational Knowledge International, a, a nonprofit based in San Francisco. Uh, my expertise is in industrial hygiene, uh, lead exposure assessment, and policy. Thank you. Uh, uh, Dalvin Hens, I think he's not available today. Is that right, Aaron? Or he was going to be late? Or, or... I think that's correct. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and then Howard Hu is also, so Dalvin is professor of uh, mechanical engineering at University of Colorado Boulder. And then Howard Hu, I think is also expected to be absent. And he is uh, chair of Department of Preventive Medicine uh, at the Keck School of Medicine, at University of Southern California. So next up is uh, Chris Johnson. Hi, good morning, everyone. Uh, good to see you all again. Uh, I'm Chris Johnson. I'm a professor of civil and environmental engineering at Syracuse University. Uh, I study, among other things, uh, the fate and transport of uh, trace metals in soils and terrestrial ecosystems. Thank you. Uh, Susan Corrick. Good morning. Um, I'm a, on the faculty at the Harvard TH Chan School of Public Health and Harvard Medical School in Boston. And uh, my areas of research focus are primarily environmental exposures as risk factors for adverse child neurodevelopment. Thank you. Uh, Bruce Lamphere. Good morning. Bruce Lamphere at Simon Fraser University. Uh, and my focus is on the epidemiology of childhood lead poisoning, including the sources and health effects as well as some on uh, heart disease in adults. Thank you. Uh, Joel Pounds. Uh, good morning, everyone. Um, I'm uh, Joel Pounds, uh, retired from the Pacific Northwest National Laboratory as a laboratory fellow emeritus. Um, my uh, experience uh, relevant to this uh, review panel uh, is focused on lead kinetics. Thank you. Uh, Brisa Sanchez. Good morning, everyone. I'm Brisa Sanchez. I'm a Dornsife and Delft professor of biostatistics. Mm -hmm. I develop and apply statistical methods to evaluate environmental health effects. And I also evaluate policies uh, for schools uh, for their effects on children's health and health disparities. Thank you. Uh, Brian Schwartz. Good morning, I'm Brian Schwartz. I'm a professor of environmental health and engineering, epidemiology and medicine at the Johns Hopkins Bloomberg School of Public Health. I am a physician and an epidemiologist and I have conducted several or large scale epidemiologic studies of health effects of lead in adults. Thank you, uh, William Stubblefield. Good morning, Bill Stubblefield. Um, I am a professor at Oregon State University. My area of expertise is ecotoxicology, specifically in the area of metals and metals bioavailability and risk assessment. Uh, and I've been involved in the KSAC review panels, a number of them since 2004. Uh, thank you very much. Kathleen Vork. 
Hi, I'm uh, Kathleen um, Bork. My, I'm a staff toxicologist with the California Environmental Protection Agency, and my um, and with the Office of Environmental Health Hazard Assessment. And my area of focus um, is occupational um, exposure assessment and pharmacokinetic modeling, biokinetic modeling in the application of risk assessment. Thank you, uh, Mark Weisskopf. Uh, yes, hi, I'm Mark Weisskopf, Professor of Environmental Health and Epidemiology at the Harvard Chan School of Public Health. Um, I have a background in neuroscience and epidemiology and focus on environmental influences on the brain, including lead and, and other metals, and also have a uh, primary interest in causal inference in environmental epidemiology studies. Thank you. And now turning to the remaining Charter Case Act members. Next up is Michelle Bell. Hi, I'm Michelle Bell at the Yale School of the Environment. I have secondary appointments at the Yale School of Public Health, the Environmental Engineering Program, and the Jackson School for Global Affairs. And my background is in epidemiology. Good morning. Thank you. Uh, Mark Frampton. Good morning. Yes, Mark Frampton from my University of Rochester Medical Center, and I'm a professor emeritus of medicine in pulmonary and critical care. Uh, my training is as a physician, and my research has been focused on uh, human uh, exposure studies. Thank you. And uh, Alexandra Ponette Gonzalez, I don't think she's here. She'll be in and out. She's teaching today. So uh we so that's it for the introductions so now i will uh invite uh steve dutton to uh deliver some epa comments and do whatever introductions of epa folks that he wishes to do all right well thank you very much leanne and members of the uh, chartered case act as well as the case act lead panel we're really happy to be meeting with you here today uh, I'm Steve Dutton. I am director of the Health and Environmental Effects Assessment Division within EPA's Office of Research and Development. And our office is responsible for producing the integrated science assessment that you have in front of you. First off, for very um, thoughtful comments and a thorough review of this document. Um, and it's definitely reflected in your draft letter that will be discussed today. Uh, we've had some time to start reading through your draft comments. And while we await the, the final letter and your discussions today, um, your feedback so far in this process has been incredibly helpful to us. Uh, and we look forward to receiving that final feedback as we strengthen the draft ISA moving forward. Um, we've uh, yeah, definitely um, been encouraged by KSAC's overall positive remarks to date um, on the draft ISA across topic. So we appreciate the, the feedback. Um, we specifically appreciate KSAC's efforts to summarize the, the tabular in tabular form the uh, recommendations on causality determinations for some of the health endpoints. They either need more justification or where KSAC has uh, differing opinions than what was presented in the draft ISA. I think Steve has frozen. Am I back? Uh, yes, you're back now. Okay, good. Yeah, my Zoom just dropped, but it looks like I'm back. Um, let's see if I can get my video to work again. Can you hear me okay? Uh, yeah, we can. Yes. yes. Okay. It says I'm sharing my video, but we'll see. That may... May come back up, but I will uh, um, pick up hopefully where I where I left off here. But I want to thank you for the encouraging uh, comments across all the topics in our draft ISA. Um, that's been been really helpful to us. Um, and I, I started to say that we specifically appreciate KSAC's efforts to summarize in tabular form the uh, recommendations to our causality conclusions uh, for some of the health endpoints where we either need to do uh, a better job justifying our position or where the case hack has differing opinions from us. 
And of course, based on the purpose of this meeting uh, and some of the preliminary comments that we've seen uh, from the panelists, uh, I recognize that those will be discussed further today and, and that we look forward to receiving your, your final recommendations. Um, you know, any recommend, recommended changes to causality that come with reasoning that's kind of based on our aspects in the ISA uh, causality framework or changes that are supported by specific evidence that you can provide to us are particularly helpful to us. Um, likewise, some of the recommendations were uh, for us to provide better justification for our conclusions and my staff are already considering ways to strengthen our justifications and make things more transparent um, in, in how we reached our conclusions uh, for several endpoints in response to your constructive feedback in the draft letter. Uh, we'll carefully consider all of KSAC's final recommendations to, to refine our causality determinations. Uh, there were two recommendations that I just wanted to point out um, that we would like to seek uh, further guidance on and clarification on from KSAC today um, and in the final letter if possible. Uh, the first is with immunosuppression. Um, so KSAC in your in your draft letter recommends that uh, that change from likely causal to suggestive, uh, pointing out an absence of toxicological evidence. Uh, EPA's causality determination in the draft document here is based largely on strong tox studies that were included in the final 2013 ISA which consistently demonstrated that lead exposure suppressed immune system. And although limited in number, we found that the recent talk studies did provide additional uh, consistent evidence of immunosuppression. So we may not have made it clear in our, our causal summary in the draft ISA that a lot of that evidence was coming um, from these older studies. And that um, if that's the case, that's something we can help clarify. Um, but in our estimation, it doesn't, it didn't change our understanding. The newer studies didn't change our understanding of these older findings. Um, so we would definitely seek some clarification from KSAC uh, on this. Um, if there's new evidence that might uh, support a suggestive conclusion, and if uh, if that's what, where you end up with your recommendation. Um, and specifically in the letter, it would be helpful for KSAC to point out uh, what the recent evidence is or reinterpretation of older evidence that increases uncertainty in the evidence base in a way that would support a change from likely causal to suggestive for immunosuppression. The other category that I just wanted to, to highlight here um, for further, uh, hopefully have some further good discussion over the next couple of days is with the pregnancy and birth outcomes recommendation. So KSAC is rec recommending that we separate those causality determinations uh, for each component of this category, and that the evidence for preeclampsia and preterm birth supports a causal relationship. In our initial conversations among staff here, uh, after looking at recommendation, um, we've found that separating this determination for each component of this category could lead to nine or more additional causality determinations. And we agree with KSAC that the evidence for some of these pregnancy and birth outcome endpoints is stronger than others. And, and perhaps the category as a whole is stronger collectively than uh, what we have in the draft ISA and could potentially support a, a change in the overall causality determination from suggestive to likely causal based on some of the endpoints that have that stronger evidence. But we do feel like a, there isn't sufficient available evidence to to support this finer parsing of causality determinations. So we definitely welcome some, some feedback on that. And we believe that the lack of biological plausibility um, in the toxicological litter really is what uh, precluded us from getting to a causal determination for these categories uh, based on our causal framework. So specifically for the letter or in discussions of the next couple of days, it would be helpful if KSLAC could point to any additional evidence um, or uh, reconsider reconsideration of older evidence uh, for potential pathways by which lead exposure could result in these adverse uh, pregnancy and birth outcomes. And much like the, the health outcomes, we're very appreciative of KSAC's careful review and supportive comments on the ecology materials presented in the draft ISA uh, and the very clear communication of recommendations that were made in your draft letter. Um, I am joined here on, on Zoom. Hopefully others are having um, better luck than me with the technology, but Evan Kaufman is our health lead. 
and he's available on the call today, um, as are the appendix leads responsible for each of the exposure and health appendices in the draft ISA. And Meredith Lassiter is our ecology lead, uh, and she is also available on the call today, uh, as are the other staff who have contributed to the atmospheric and uh, ecology sections of the ISA. So again, I just wanna thank you for your thoughtful feedback to date um, in our meeting in June and in the draft uh, letter we have um, received from you. And we look forward to discussions today and tomorrow uh, and to receiving Case Act's final letter to help guide our revisions on the ISA. So thank you, back to you, Leanne. Thank you, Steve. And uh, now I think we'll begin our deliberations. So uh, getting to the right place to start is always a uh, takes a minute for a lot of us. Uh, we are starting with the consensus responses to uh, the discussion points. That's appendix one. That is the page that has number five at the bottom. And if you're looking at the PDF, it's the 10th page of the PDF document. So <clears throat> we will go through uh, yeah, this text. Uh, right now, we uh, invite people if they have any comments for um, the, at least the first the, the information on page five. And we didn't receive any comments in advance about this section. Um, at least on page five. So we can circle back if somebody comes up with something as we discuss uh, appendix one further, but I'm gonna move on to page six and see if anyone has any comments on page six. And I know um, uh, George Allen has a proposed paragraph that he wanted to uh, discuss. I suspect that's my cue. <laughs> um, there were uh, several of us, uh, uh, led initially by Bruce, who then had to go off and check out some lead mine. <laughs> but uh, the, the issue was uh, adding some discussion material regarding ways to get more uh, measurement data for lead, not necessarily compliance data, uh, but for use uh, perhaps in uh, larger scale epi studies. Maybe Bruce, do you want to kind of address the rationale behind uh, behind that? You could probably do a better job than I. Thank you, George. And thank you for writing that up. You did a much better job than I could. Uh, so this in part was um, a holdover from 2006, 2008 KSAC lead panel, which recommended the same thing, which is, we needed more data, air monitoring data for lead to better understand uh, the health impacts uh, at lower levels. And then without that, we we're sort of handicapped in understanding uh, the, the health impacts. And there was a short, I think like one year increase in the national, if we can call it national monitoring network from 100 to 200 monitors, uh, but it was short lived. and soon dropped back down to 100 uh, because it was largely based on compliance rather than understanding uh, effects at lower levels of airborne lead. So the, the, the focus here is really to say that uh, just like what we've seen with PM 2.5 and other criteria pollutants, having those measures across the United States is really critical, necessary, urgent, uh, I'm not quite sure what other word to use to, to make sure that you're actually protecting the public's health. And so um, while I appreciate George's uh, paragraph, I think it's right on target. Uh, maybe what I'd like to do is ask Stephen uh, Dutton, what, what can we say to make sure that the urgency and importance of this is, is understood by EPA? Um, that would be the only minor modification I'd suggest to George's paragraph, because I just don't think this is, it's not an academic exercise. Uh, this is, this is something that's really critical if we want to make sure 
we're protecting the public health. We, we may be talking about somewhere between 100 and 250,000 deaths every year in the United States. Uh, and we don't have adequate data on air monitoring to understand that very well. Go ahead, Steve. Yeah, sure. I, I think what you have written in the in the draft letter here is is very helpful to us. Um, and you know, I think this is a good place to to share that uh, perspective from a scientific. Um, angle and certainly I, I would invite any of our um, oer colleagues and you know i can bring this up to them as well uh, to see if there's anything else that would be helpful to have in the letter here um but yeah i think i think what you have in here is is clearly articulated i can't think of anything additional that would be um that i would recommend having in here and steve you're referring to the, the one paragraph that we, that was posted uh, monday afternoon is that right um, yeah, the, you had, I think it's in the letter here a couple places, right? You have, or, or in your comments, I think it was in your comments, George, wasn't it, where I saw that? Yeah, it's uh, George's individual comments yes. posted yep. on the 21st. Yep. Yeah, that was the paragraph that Perry and, and Bruce and myself and a few others uh, put together in, in response to Bruce's uh, uh, desire to, you know, emphasize the point. Um, there, Aaron's putting it up on the screen. Uh, yes. Thank you, yeah. Aaron. And, That's helpful. And the, the point here is it's not new monitoring, it's just analysis of existing filters from uh, PM10 and PM2.5 FRMs. And it is not a compliance piece because these monitors, uh, certainly PM10, can be used for compliance for lead NACs if the readings are no more than half of the NACs design value. But the intent here is to get at a, a you know a broader, uh, more detailed spatial scale of levels that are you know not related to uh, to compliance. So we'll open it up to the gang. Uh, so if, if, I, okay. if I could just jump in, um, it, was this circulated? I didn't get George's comments. Uh, yeah, it was. Uh, Aaron sent it out, and it's posted on the meeting website as well. Um, All right, well, I'll go to the know, meeting website. I just wonder if there's other comments I didn't get. Uh, uh, I just got one email with uh, my comments and uh, Schwartz's comments. Yeah, I'm, I'm not sure. Aaron, did you send this this one out to the entire panel? I th He did. Okay. I, well, at least I have it based on that. Okay. Uh, um, we have preliminary comments. So circling back on the preliminary comments that were pasted, posted on the web from what I uh, saw, and I know that when we get so many emails uh, and some of us are getting them for three different panels right now, um, uh, it's hard to keep on top of all the details. So I fully get that, um, having struggled with that myself in the past week. But we have comments uh, from uh, Brian Schwartz that were um, uh, the the date on the document name is eight uh, ten. We have comments from Mark Frampton. The uh, date on the document title is eight sixteen. We have comments from uh, Susan Corrick with the eight eighteen date, and we have comments from. Um, uh, George Allen with a date of 821. And uh, uh, yeah, so those are the ones that I'm aware of that have been posted. Aaron can chime in if there's anything else. Yeah, that and and it, he, did, he did email this out um, for the end of the day on the 21st. Yeah. All right, and it's on the screen, so that's another way to read it right now. Uh, while people are trying to wrap their heads around this, Perry, you have a comment. Yes, thank you. And uh, let me thank George for taking the lead on this and for Bruce's input as well. Um, I would say that from our discussions at the um, meeting in June, one of the concerns was increasing monitoring for compliance, but a separate um, issue was raised about research. And the draft uh, report um, talks about additional monitoring, but I, I think there's a few places where it fails to be clear as to where we're calling for 
uh, the use of monitoring data for research and where we're calling for more um, uh, compliance monitoring under the NACs. So I, I just think we should just be very um, careful about that aspect. And that's true um, for the language on page uh, six and seven, as well as in the cover letter. Uh, but secondly, um, in regards to this paragraph that's up on the screen, um, I do have one concern about the sentence starting on line 18 about uh, for non-source uh, oriented measurements. Um, it seems to, uh, and I expressed this to, to George too in the last couple of days, it seems to uh, provide uh, what may be the outcome of the research, uh, which is not to, to me yet shown that, uh, that, that PM2.5 is an appropriate measurement. Uh, because I think there are concerns about soil reentrainment and other exposures that would come into play um, if we limited our uh, airborne lead scale to 2.5. Uh, so I just think we should more carefully word this to express that, you know, this is um, what is intended to be um, research. And one of the research questions is to uncover what the appropriate measurements might be. Uh, thanks, Perry. I mean, the original intent of this, and it doesn't mean it can't change, was to say, what can we do uh, with the existing measurements, uh, mm -hmm. the existing network, particularly in this case, FRMs for PM 2.5 and PM 10, as opposed to putting out uh, additional compliance oriented uh, monitors, which could be PM 10 if you are, again, talking less than half the next that's that's allowed for for compliance purposes, even though your numbers might be low, which could be an issue for health analysis purposes. So, you know, we could certainly go beyond this and maybe we do elsewhere in the letter and say, you know, we want more compliance or oriented monitors, but the, the goal here was to say, look, what can we do with what we have? And in fact, even going backwards, several up to seven or more years, because the filters are archived and just a matter of running them through uh, XRF, which as Judy knows is fast and cheap. <laughs> That's correct. <clears throat> okay, uh, so uh, Mark, you still have your hand up. Do you have? Uh... No, sorry. Okay. Um, Jim Boylan. I get, my question was a more a clarification. Uh, I wasn't clear if we were asking EPA to do this analysis or are we just stating a fact that there's data out there that somebody in the research world can go do this analysis? I, I, I'm not clear on what what our point is. Are we asking EPA to do this? Or are we just making stating some fact that there's data available for somebody to go do this? That's a good question. Um, we could change it into an ask. I mean, the data are not there yet. It would. Matter. Somebody would have to go out and collect all the filters from state and locals and then, uh, you know, get contracted out to get them analyzed. Um, but, you know, we could make it an ask as opposed to an idea. Right now, it's just an idea. Uh, it, it could be a future resource re uh, research topic uh, for this appendix. Uh, uh, I, I would like to encourage us to make it an ask that EPA go out and do this. Um, I, I would hope that they'd also conduct some of the relevant research, but also to make it available for other scientists to look at and evaluate. So I would, I would encourage us to make it an ask. And that gets us to the point of saying, this isn't just a good idea. This is, this is important. We'd like to ask the EPA to do this. Okay, uh, if we're gonna change that, uh, um, we either now should come up with some wording or we can wordsmith offline to, um, to change the wording to reflect that. Uh, 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 Judy, or George, did you- Well, they want... ask, you could just say on, on line 15, one relatively low cost option that the KSAC thinks would be useful or the case act would like EPA to pursue dot 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 that makes it an ask okay Judy oh 
I was uh, going to get back to Perry's uh, non-source RNG measurement. That would that be better with non-compliance? So they uh, they they in compliance, but they still have the measurement. So I was wondering that. Another thing is, I think uh, it is important to emphasize that. Like Bruce said, this is a 2000, we did have in the consensus report 2006 2008 KSEC lead panel recommends sizable increase of light monitor. But uh, however, the size has been reduced. In our consensus uh, report, we also mentioned a criteria for site elimination that should be specified, really should be clarified why they kill those sites and some new sites. Some, some measurement, even if they're in compliance with standard, but they might have some spikes. So, um, yeah, the, these seem like useful comments. I'm not sure how to uh, operationalize them to a report based on this conversation. Uh, can somebody help me with that? Well, the, the earlier recommendations from the, 2006, 2008, lead panel are, are there at line 27, page six. Um, so this is, you know, this would, as, I, as it says, would get inserted, potentially get inserted at line 40. Um, after we talk about, you know, low, low lead levels, um, okay. low air quality levels, um, and the deployment of additional monitors um, to assess lead below the current NAX and, and then boom, this would go in. Um, it might still need some additional integration into uh, that charge question. You mean the new paragraph needs some additional integration? Is that what you're saying? Well, you know, dropping this into to line 40, we then need to look at that entire charge question response to make sure it hangs together. Okay, I, I think I, we can do, if that's wordsmithing, we can do that offline. I, I, I think so. I mean, I, I wrote this kind of as a standalone um, in response to Bruce's ask, um, and it more or less fits, but again, I haven't really gone through it to make sure it's fully integrated. And uh, I wanna also make sure we're addressing um, Perry's comment um, uh, about distinguishing uh, new research from compliance is what I understood he was saying. Uh, so that needs to be addressed in this uh, appendix text. I'm not exactly sure where uh, and how many places we need to address that. Um, yeah. It's, it's already in there not for compliance use, but it might need to be emphasized that it is research, not compliance. That could even be put at the end. Um, this approach, uh, which is for research purposes, not compliance use, can also inform lead health endpoints. So that could be attached to that last sentence. I don't know if that... Okay. Meets, meets Perry's uh, needs or not. Yeah, and I, uh, Perry, you can speak for yourself, but um, my sense is you thought maybe the whole appendix one summary could be clean, clarified a little bit about um, um, research versus compliance. Yes, exactly. It wasn't um, just the new draft language, but the bottom paragraph on page six uh, currently, I think is unclear. It starts talking about compliance monitors being decreased, but then it starts talking about research in the same paragraph, but it's not quite clear where we're shifting here. So I guess um, the first question I have is, you know, is there a consensus to call for more compliance monitoring? And then secondly, uh, it does seem like there is a consensus to call for more research monitoring, but just to clarify it in all places where we raise this. Uh, for example, on the next page where we talk about targeting monitoring to community, um, again, there we have to be clear as to whether we're talking about compliance monitoring with TSP or some other uh, research approach. Okay. Um, uh, what exactly where, what line number are you on? Just so everybody can follow you. 
Sure, on page seven, line 11, it calls for additional neighborhood air monitoring, um, but this should be clarified um, to indicate you know, whether this is targeted to communities in proximity to lead emissions or some other communities. It also says to ensure not that there's there's you know not safe exposure levels. I mean, excuse me. To, to, to the, it, it adds that the purpose is to determine whether there are safe exposure levels. But really, I think what the purpose should be is to ensure compliance and um, provide additional data for research, not safe exposure levels. So the word neighborhood in there, uh, I think, Judy, you probably wrote that. And I think, do you mean neighborhood scale? Correct. Neighborhood scale monitoring means anywhere between 0.5 to 4 kilometer radius from the, uh, any industry sources. So it's a small, it's a community monitoring. It, it intended to ensure safe exposure level does not necessarily have to meet compliance. Right, and it's not source oriented. No, it's a community scale. Right, right. The neighborhood right. scale. Yeah, should I change that to neighborhood scale? Yeah, I think that would help. Um, yeah. We, you know, neighborhood, you know, it gets, it can get confusing for those of us, unlike you and I, who kind of live in the, the spatial scale, scale terminology. Yeah, that's and right. It, neighborhood scale is specifically defined to 0 0.5 to 4 kilometer. Right, that's, you know, yeah. micro, micro, mid, neighborhood. Yeah, urban, exactly. Yeah, so that, that, that lingo. But that's, yeah. that, that scale, that, that terminology is for compliance, right? It's, no. Okay. It's for, for, mon for monitor the representativeness of the monitoring site for the community. So that neighborhood scale monitoring means they represent a community exposure not necessary for compliance. Right, I mean, individual sites in EPA's databases are classified uh, with that spatial scale of representation. So okay. just to clarify, you're saying that paragraph was not intended for compliance? You were not increasing the number of mon asking for more monitoring for compliance? No, I. The, that, the paragraph is intend to note that they are com specific community need to be uh, need to be additional monitoring to protect public health. Okay, so maybe that could be combined uh, or uh, follow the research oriented paragraph that George has uh, drafted. Yeah, actually, George, that's not a bad idea to put it there. Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, put it. Put it after line 11 of uh, page seven. So move it from page six. Mm -hmm. Because. Uh, sure. Yeah, that's quite a good idea because then we, we talk about neighborhood scale monitoring, then we talk about additional uh, resources can be available if, if uh, EPA, uh, KSAC recommend EPA to com conduct additional lead analysis for from the FRM site. Yeah, that works. Yeah. Okay, uh, I see a couple of hands up. I think we've got this topic covered. I, I guess I'll want to circle back before we leave appendix one to make sure that Perry, you think that your concern about uh, uh, our lack of clarity about what we're saying is compliance versus research is addressed in this entire section. So um, I'm, I'm giving you a heads up now and then I'll move to these other hands uh, so we can make sure that uh, we've covered that um, because it I mean, we could circle back to this tomorrow if we need to, if, we, if this needs a little bit of offline uh, kibitzing before we uh, settle on a couple of details. So that's also a possibility. Uh, but before we uh, address that, Phil, you have your hand up. Yeah, I uh, just wanted to um, offer one suggestion. I, I like the idea of uh, the two asks. Um, and so uh, just offering a suggestion on the rewording. Um, uh, as far as you know, making it clear about uh, the ask that EPA reevaluate the number of monitors on page six. 
that is already there. It's just the second sentence on the paragraph covers lines 35 and 36. So the suggestion is just make that the first sentence. Uh, so you're saying line uh, 35, uh, make the, the, that the first sentence of that paragraph, the EPA should reevaluate? Okay. Evaluate the number of monitors and then go into since the number of monitors are deep. Yeah. So I would just rearrange that, put the ask right up front. And then in George, your paragraph, um, which it sounds like might fit better now on, on page seven, same thing, say something along the lines of the EPA should consider, um, you know, conducting additional research and analysis of existing, you know, PM monitoring data, and then all the additional detail follow. So it's just a, a suggestion um, for the wordsmith. Okay, that sounds helpful. Thank you. Uh, I think we're on to Bruce. Who has his hand up? Thank now? you. Yeah, thank you. Uh, and I like Bill's suggestion. Uh, and I just wanted to add, even though some of these citations are uh, included elsewhere, that we already have half a dozen or more uh, studies, including EPA's own study on air lead, blood lead, that support the evidence that we need to look at lower and lower airborne concentrations of lead. And so I'd include those citations and happy to provide those or work with whoever is going to help revise that. Thank you. Okay, so uh, uh, we'll add those and uh, you'll provide those to make sure they get in the right place. Christina. Thank you. So I just had a uh, question related to the spatial scale that Judy and George were talking about in terms of the neighborhood scale. Is it 0 0.5 to four kilometers like from the center of the community or is it like four square kilometers? The idea is that it rep represents that spatial domain, not necessarily distant from a source or anything or, or any kind of city. Okay. Typically from the receptor site means the monitoring site. When they do a neighborhood scale monitoring, we have to do a micro inventory, they do a survey, they do a lot of different things before they locate that site. Okay. And is that an EPA definition? Is that yes. kind of absurd? Okay. Yes. I can get you the, I think I can find the references. Okay. All right. Thank you. Yeah. So, I mean, in this case, it means you have to be at least a half kilometer away from a significant point source. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Perry. Uh, yeah, I'm appreciating everybody's comments. I guess the only thing I just wanted to circle back to is this language about it being an appropriate measurement. I just feel like we should uh, back down from that a bit. Um, so we could wordsmith that offline if that helps. And uh, where are you talking about? Uh, That's in, in my write up. Okay. Yeah. Uh, we could change, you know, useful, uh, appropriate might be too strong, as I think we had in the email thread. And I'm happy to make that a word that uh, is, is less, uh, you know, less forceful. Okay, uh, thank you. And uh, is are there any, so we have uh, had wide ranging comments about mostly about uh, appendix one, pages six and seven of the document. I want to see if there are any additional comments or details that need to be addressed in appendix one, uh, including um, Perry's broad comment about making sure that we're clear about our request for research versus compliance uh, level monitoring. Susan. Yeah, thanks. I, I mean, um, I, I just had a, um, oh, never mind. This is Appendix 2. Sorry. All right. We'll be on to that a little bit, I hope. Uh, last call for any comments on Appendix 1. Uh, and maybe uh, just for an efficiency point of view and so that I can make sure that we've navigated it if, if uh, well, since we do have a meeting tomorrow, if maybe those of you who 
uh, are chiming in on this chapter can help with the proposed edits to make sure we got those details right. That would help in case we need to discuss anything more tomorrow. And also I would ask uh, George in particular, and I guess Perry also to make sure when we get to the letter that some of these details are brought into the letter. Help me keep track of that since you know this material much better than I do. So I would appreciate that. When we so, get there. Lan, do you think we should bring the ask part of the uh, doing additional analysis into the letter? Uh, well, I guess that's a, maybe a question for the panel. Is, is this important enough? I mean, based on what I heard Bruce say, I would say yes. Is this important enough to add a sentence to the letter? It's probably not a paragraph, probably a sentence in the letter. Uh, and so we need to figure out what that sentence is and where it goes, because right now that's not at all in the letter. So... Uh, So we won't get to the letter uh, until later. So we have a little time <laughs> for those of you who are working, helping me with this to figure this out uh, and we'll get back to it. But I want you to help me uh, keep uh, keep on top of it. Judy. Do it, are we at the point you, you want to uh, revise the consensus report for appendix one by tomorrow? Is that what you say? Well, I don't think we have to finalize all the little small details, but if there's anything major that I heard a few major things, uh, particularly I'm a little bit worried that Perry's comment about this distinction between research and compliance has, uh, that we've gotten all the pieces. So I, if, if we can, if there's anything big that we need to talk about, I want us to talk about it tomorrow. That's, I guess, my, my, my main point. No, we don't have to fully revise it, just if there's anything big uh, that uh, we haven't already discussed. Does that help, Judy? Yeah, thanks. Uh, we've all been doing a, a way too much last minute KSAC work lately. So <laughs> for the past, I don't know, it's been a long time where it's happening. So uh, we, uh, yeah, I'm not asking for, for more than what we need to deliberate in in public. Okay, thanks. Thank you, Jim. I guess I'm just asking for a clarification. As far as compliance monitoring, we're not asking for more monitors for compliance. We're only asking for more monitoring for research. Is that a correct statement or or, or not? I mean, the, the way I read it is we're not asking for more monitoring for compliance. Is that correct? That was also the issue that I've raised here, and I don't feel like we've gotten a conclusion to that, but um, I do feel that it's important that we have more monitoring. I think that, uh, you know, TSP is currently the regulatory standard, and so we need to uh, ask for more there, especially if, in the event that monitoring uh, stations even slip to a lower number in the future, given greater compliance with the current standard. Yeah, so this is, I guess, why I was hoping that we would make sure that we, we get this resolved. So thank you for your clarifying question, Jim, and uh, for so we can try to get this sorted out before uh, while we're deliberating in public. Judy. Yeah, we, we are asking for both. It depends on the situation. So that's why it's in different paragraph, Perry. That the paragraph is on page six address the the concerns since 2006, 2008 case at that panel. Then but page seven gives some example and plus George says another, in addition to that, we can use much less costly uh, existing uh, FRM network. So we're asking for both, right Bruce? Yeah. Uh, I guess or my comment, well, um, I guess just follow up on my comment. I mean, the requirement already is for any source emitting more than a half a ton of lead is required to have a source oriented monitor for compliance already. So are we asking for more than that? And if so, are we going to provide criteria for requiring more than that? I mean, there already is the criteria. 
if you're emitting more than a half a ton of lead, you must have a source oriented monitor for compliance. And to me, that is adequate for, for the current standard. Of course, if the standard was lowered, I think we would need to reevaluate the criteria. But under the current standard for the current compliance, um, I mean, I I didn't know if we were asking for more uh, for compliance. I, I agree with more for research. Um, but I guess we need to be clear on, on what we're asking. Thank you. Uh, Judy, did you want to respond to that? Yeah. Am I, yeah, uh, correct that, uh, however, that uh, as uh, our individual come out of discussion during the meeting that I point out that uh, we uh, we have only 75% of the sites showing the decreasing trends, but that does not represent the recent high light concentration. I think I had example in Indiana and uh, Ohio, so that uh, it does not necessarily means the currently monitoring network is adequate to protect public health. That's why we're not, you know, we're asking EPA to evaluate the situation. All right, uh, George. I, I wanted to uh, check in with Perry when he says compliance monitoring, at least per EPA regs, uh, PM10 can be compliance monitoring if you end up with numbers that are no more than half of the NACs. So, Perry, when you say compliance monitoring, do you mean TSP or TSP or PM10 with that caveat on the PM10? I'm just trying to clarify what the ask for the additional compliance monitoring is. Perry, do you have your thoughts? Yeah, I mean, I, I would be concerned about uh, limiting this or even uh, uh, prescribing a particular procedure for this, uh, given that there is these existing cutoffs for point sources, et cetera. But I, I think, you know, that might be getting too much into the grains for our purposes. However, uh, I do feel very strongly that we should be talking about TSP monitoring because we don't have, I, to my uh for my purposes anyway, enough comparison of airborne lead with TSP and with PM10 and 2.5 to make the determination about what's the most appropriate. And we need to be concerned about reentrainment of soil, which uh, to my mind is getting more attention, not less attention as we look at this um, in the larger uh, scheme of public health. Well, I just, we just need to make sure that if, if we're asking for more and if we use the term compliance monitoring, you know, we need to make sure we aren't asking for more TSP monitoring uh, since PM10 can also be compliant. So I just wanted to better understand uh, when we ask for compliant, more compliance monitoring. But I agree with Jim uh, that, you know, we already have requirements for uh, sources greater than a half ton per year, um, that's already in place. So it sounds like if we're asking for more compliance monitoring, we are in effect asking for that threshold trigger threshold to be reduced. And do we want to put a number? Do we want to say we'd like to get compliance monitoring everywhere where there's a quarter ton per year instead of a half ton? I, de I definitely think it should be reduced. I don't know what the number would be. <laughs> well, you know, we're already at a half ton required, cutting that in half, you know. Uh, you definitely increase the number of monitors by quite a bit. It goes up exponentially as you lower that ton per year threshold. So, I mean, if we're asking for more compliance monitoring, that might be the framework to put it in. Actually, I think that's a good idea. Because Bruce mentioned that uh, even with uh, the current uh, monitoring with this criteria, it's just not adequate. That's the whole thing started. So maybe we should get back to Jim's question about this criteria. I mean, you could take the data that's out there and move your slider one from 0.5 to 0.4 to 0.3 to you know get what you think is an adequate network and then then we could have a concrete recommendation for increasing the compliance network as opposed to this research thing 
using existing uh, samplers. So it sounds like we're headed that way. And this, uh, you know, I'm also a little bit mindful of the time because we spent an hour on one appendix. So uh, we can't do that for the rest of the report or we will be here for weeks. Uh, but um, this may, this may, like, where's the, where are you going to move the slider and what are you going to recommend? This may actually re require some offline deliberation. That's more where I was thinking. And I really appreciate this conversation uh, uh, to clarify what people think is important. Uh, Judy, your hand's still up. I assume that that's left over. And, uh, or did you want to say something more? Yeah, um, I think that we can actually um, incorporate this suggestion at uh, around the after the page 9, 932 on page six in terms of the reevaluate the criteria to see if it's adequate to protect the public health. So we can, yeah, we can do that. So maybe offline you could come up with a number and then okay. and then we'll talk about the number tomorrow and uh, and then and then you've already suggested a place where it could go, which is excellent. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, um, uh, Bruce. You're muted, I think. I just wanted to say I concur with the idea of lowering the level that right now is being used from a half ton to something else. And again, there's already some evidence indicating that uh, you're seeing significant exposure and health effects at lower concentrations. Um, so that's worthy. I think the challenging part, of course, is we're both suggesting that and suggesting we need research to better understand what the level should be. But I think we can, I think we can uh, address that. Yeah. Okay. Let's, uh, again, getting back to this distinction between compliance and research is an important one. Uh, thank you, uh, Jim. Yeah, well, so, you know, the um, back to the compliance in a half a ton, you know, a, a lot of monitors were installed when the requirement came out, the half a ton requirement, and they've been there monitoring for years and years. And what a lot of them are finding is that the measurements are well below the NACs for these sources at a half a ton. And in fact, if you're less than half of the NACs, you can shut down the monitor. And all the monitors in Georgia, all the NACs compliant monitors in Georgia have since been shut down because of that, which tells me that, you know, if you're putting a, a monitor there for compliance and a half a ton and, and all these monitors are well below the NACs um, at a half a ton, um, do we really need to be putting more out um, when, when there are, all these monitors are shutting down uh, because they're, they're monitoring well below the NACs? I mean, I'm in agreement that if the NACs is lowered, then we're going to have to come back and talk about this. But under the current NACs, um, I mean, I, I think the half a ton is appropriate. So, All right. Uh, I think uh, unless anybody else wants to weigh in, I think we need to leave this, uh, given how much time we've spent on it. Uh, we do need to come back to it tomorrow, and hopefully our heads will be clearer about the details. We've heard a lot of different perspectives here, um, and I'm not quite sure how to distill it all down, but I'm hoping that uh, those of you with expertise in this area will help us make sure that anything more that we need to say in public that will be reflected in our report get said tomorrow. So we'll put this on the agenda for tomorrow, be, probably be at the rate we're going before we get to the letter. So uh, anything else on appendix one? All right, now appendix two and Susan, I'm gonna call on you because I know you were ready to talk about appendix two. We're, uh, we're on Page seven, uh, it starts on line 25 and uh, uh, we can stick with page seven for now uh, or it, uh, that's probably clear. Go yeah, ahead. I mean, in some ways this hopefully isn't a big issue but I just found um, lines 42 to 44 a little confusing. 
um, it, it's a section that's um, enumerating areas that could use a little bit of additional information. And I think it's referring to the looking at whether um, changes in lead exposure are reflecting or somehow responding to um, uh, discrepancies in exposure risk for different groups. But I, I couldn't quite follow um, what, what was intended in that evidence to assess if the reduction in the race ethnicity gap is proportionate to the reduction in blood leads in previous decades, or if the gap has been reduced as a relative percentage of population blood lead. So is that trying to see if, if the reduction in blood lead is, is proportionally the same across all groups, regardless of their exposure risk, or if it's um, if more effective at decreasing exposure risk in high-risk groups? <laughs> and I, I just couldn't tell what it was saying. It seems like it's an important area for research, or for not research, but for consideration in general. Um, and I, I can't follow the, the, the description. All right, thank you. Is there an author of this section or a contributor to this section that wants to help uh, with understanding? Bill. Yeah, in real time, I'm trying to trace back, uh, you know, this is obviously a summary of uh, four or five people's comments and I can't trace it back right in real time here. So I'm gonna have to, I, I see your question and I agree with your point uh, that it can be clarified, but I'll invite um, Kathleen, Harry, Joel, um, to uh, see if in real time they can wordsmith this. Yeah, I, mean, yeah. I just think it's an important point and it would be good to make it a little clearer. Yeah, and, and we don't <laughs> have to wordsmith it so much as just make it clear what we're trying to say. Right. Um, yeah, Perry. Yes, uh, I take responsibility for raising this. Uh, but uh, I, I think that the reason it's not clear is that EPA was not clear in their report and we were telling them, hey, you got to clarify what you're saying here in this particular section. Okay, so that seems a lot more straightforward to say it that way. EPA wasn't clear about what they meant and we wanted to be clearer. Because in the same paragraph, they were talking about uh, differences in, in uh, subpopulations and at the same time, they were talking about lower exposures overall, and it wasn't clear what they were getting at. Okay, so that seems like a straightforward edit that can happen offline to ask for, uh, to, to rewrite it, to make it clear that EPA wasn't clear, which is why you didn't understand it, Susan, because it wasn't clear. Yeah. yeah, yeah, I mean, I think somewhere in there is an important point. <laughs> it just needs to be, the, the issue that EPA needs to clarify, maybe we need to be clearer about. Okay, so we so I'm going to ask, uh, I guess, Perry and Phil, uh, and maybe you can consult with Susan uh, to suggest some wording for that um, offline. I don't think we need, now that we know the point, we don't need to word, wordsmith it specifically. All right, moving on to page eight. Anything on page eight? Brian. So, so starting um, in appendix, in our comments about appendix two and continuing throughout the health chapters, we refer to bone lead. And I would like to see a, a bit more precision in language about what bone we're talking about because the kinetics and bioavailability of lead is not the same in all the different places that lead can be measured in bone. And I think that uh, it has implications for the interpretation of this document. It just feels a little bit lazy to say bone lead when it could be patella, tibia, calcaneus, uh, vertebral bodies, et cetera. So that, that could be a lot of work because you not, might need to go back to the studies and see what they measured. But I think being imprecise here uh, reflects poorly on us. Okay, and you had a specific comment about this on, uh, I think it was page nine, line five, starting on line five. Well, um, wherever the term bone lead appears, I think it's a problem. Okay, so how do we resolve that? Um, Susan. Yeah, I mean, I think, Brian, you're bringing up a really important point. But I think, I, I mean, I, I bristle a little bit at the lazy since I wrote a lot of the health stuff <laughs> around this, um, because I think that 
that at, there's a it's sort of a laddered process, right? And the first tier is that bone lead, regardless of the site, reflects a longer exposure window. There are differences in bioavailability and the exposure windows vary, but it's a much longer exposure window than blood lead. And that particular dichotomy is very informative in some respects because I think there are certain measures that are more likely um, sensitive to longer term versus shorter term exposure. And I think that's a totally appropriate use of bone lead as a sort of generic descriptor. And then I think if, you know, the issue of the bioavailability and toxicokinetic variability by bone site is important. And I think that's the next level. And I guess the question is where in the document is it worthwhile going into that level of detail? And where is the fundamental principle just long-term versus short-term exposure, which I realize is an oversimplification, but I think it's still informative and relevant. Um, so, I, you know, I'm not sure where to put the more granular information first in, in some ways, but see what Mark has to say. Go ahead, Mark. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so I see, I see both points here. I mean, what, one place where I think it's relevant is that there have been a lot of other comments in different places about um, things like not enough distinction between a cross-sectional study with blood versus a, a study that's cross-sectional but has a longer-term marker, and also this issue of just different windows of exposure and when they matter. And so, I, I certainly would agree that I mean, may, maybe some text at the beginning that sort of explains that these biomarkers have different windows they reflect. And, and the point that's particularly relevant is that, and this has come up also in some of the comments, is that at times there's sort of a reference to kind of inconsistency in results. But when that inconsistency comes because one's a blood study and one's a tibia study, you know, that that is not necessarily inconsistent. It's just that you have different windows there. So I, I guess where there are places where that kind of thing pops up and the difference between a somewhat shorter long-term exposure in, in uh, trabecular bone versus cortical, it does make sense to do that. But but I, I guess I'm saying maybe one of the ways around this is to have a little intro text somewhere that kind of explains this and says why you know it, it matters what period you're averaging over and that different exposure metrics and even bone is not a monolithic uh, can matter and can lead to differences in results that are not inconsistencies. They're just reflecting different windows that matter. Mark, you're making an excellent point. Can I, uh, can I, can I ask you to- yeah, I retract everything. I, no, I'm joking. <laughs> <laughs> can I ask you to take the lead on A, figuring out where in the document this belongs? Uh, uh, because we probably, if we say it once very clearly, these kinds of distinctions, maybe Brian will be happy with us being quote unquote lazy in some other places. Um, well, I guess part of what I was saying that was also, and unfortunately this probably means does looking through, is that there may be some places where it is particularly important <laughs> to point it out as to Brian's point. I, 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 I don't remember the text, so I don't, I don't remember exactly where this comes up. Yeah. Out. Yeah. Okay. So there's, so then there's two points, the, the need for um, a, a paragraph that makes these clarifications about the, 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 uh, when the details matter and when they don't, and uh, that has to do both with study design and with uh, the types of lead measurements. That's what I heard Mark saying that that's needed and the exposure time windows and the relevance of all that. And then in addition to that, either referencing that or whether some of the references of blood versus bone or are just talking about blood and bone need to be cleaned up. I guess that, so there's kind of, so I'm hearing two different things that we need to look at. Uh, Susan, uh, Kathy, excuse me. Yeah, I just like to throw in another component of this is, um, there's a lot of uncertainty in um, at least the kinetics. Um, and I think that of bone lead, um, you know, we know that it's that, you know, cortical bone is dec, you know, is decades. We know that trabecular bone is years. We know that other tissue, you know, is months, but um, to, to give it something uh, more precise than that, I, I'm not sure that the um, certainty is there 
at least um, that's brought out in, for example, um, Leggett's paper on the bone kinetics. And uh, that was, you know, um, published in 1993. Maybe there's some more clarity since then on bone kinetics. But um, the other thing is, is that the bone kinetics is going to be different, obviously, in children than adults because the, you know, because of the growing bone versus the, the declining um, levels of, of calcium in, in older adults. So I just like to offer that um, component of, of clarification and the limitations of, of what we can clarify. Okay, and we'll need to figure out in the context of trying to do this clarification where that gets addressed. So not hearing the specifics yet. Uh, Phil, maybe you'll help us navigate this. Well, I, I, I agree, Kathy, with what you just said that um, uh, we at least ought to be a little bit cautious uh, about uh, trying to make some oversimplifying conclusions about uh, windows that are appropriate for the different compartments. Um, I'm also struggling a little bit uh, with exactly how we're going to incorporate some of the uh, comments that that were just made. As I look at the existing text on page nine, beginning at line 28, uh, that first sentence reads: uh, "Different kinetics for blood and bone compartments over time, potentially confounding the interpretation of epidemiological study results, is well described." So the case act here is saying uh, EPA have done a good job kind of acknowledging those different windows in, in, in terms of your interpreting you know, epi data. So my concern here that, uh, that there might be a slightly different tone or recommendation. So um, if that's true, we probably need some more offline discussion. Um, also, I'll just point out lines 35 and 36, just one sentence says uh, variability in rates of bone remodeling with age and pregnancy lactation periods, as well as differences between trabecular and cortical bone kinetics are well described. So here again, the case act is, is um, looking for uh, you know, some um, uh, appropriate uh, uh, distinction in kinetics of different bone compartments um, in EPA summary. And, and we seem to be saying that they're doing a, a relatively good job there. So, so I'm just struggling a little bit with uh, thinking about how to incorporate some of the comments uh, this morning, uh, given the context that we have here uh, already stated. Great, thank you. That's very helpful. And I see uh, Peter Burley from US EPA wants to weigh in, and this is, could be a really valuable time to hear from EPA. Yeah, hi. I, I just wanted to quickly mention, um, for those of you on the committee that didn't review this section, um, just mentioned section 2.2.2.2 uh, uh, on bone kinetics that we have in the exposure appendix. Um, I just wanted to mention that in context for the uh, committee's comments on including more information, because we do include some information on um, half times of trabecular versus cortical bone there. And so, um, and some other information, you know, describing the differences between those different types of bones. So um, just wanted to mention that in case it was, you know, uh, not seen. Thank you. And, uh, uh, you know, we're at, we're at the point of trying to reach consensus about what we wrote, not so much deliberating on what what we reviewed in the report. So obviously they're, they they go together, but um, but yeah, that could be overlooked. So thank you for that, Brian. So I, I, I agree with all the comments that were made. Um, I do feel that the general discussion of, of kinetics is adequate. I think maybe one compromise is where we refer to a specific association in a specific study, we should refer to what was measured, not the general concept of bone lead. When we're talking about the general concept of bone med and lead in the different kinetics, uh, I'm okay using general language, and I think it's actually adequate. It's only when we refer to specific studies and then we say there was an association between bone lead and some outcome where we have to say what was measured. 
Okay, that seems like a way forward uh, is to look for every place where we mentioned bone lead in our consensus comments and then maybe the letter as well and be able to distinguish when we're making a general point about bone lead versus where we're making a specific point about say some re evidence that has to do with a study that uh, where we should be specific. So that seems like a very clear path forward. We will need to, uh, a couple of us will need to go through and look for all those places um, uh, to address it. So um, that's helpful, thank you. Uh, Susan. Sorry, I'm just, I mean, I, this is a little bit down in the weeds, but in this the section that Phil just highlighted, um, page nine, lines 28 and 29, I actually think um, different kinetics for blood and bone compartments are not a source of confounding in interpretation of epidemiologic study results. And I think this is actually important because they're a source of exposure misclassification potentially, which is different. Um, so I don't remember, I'm not sure. I, I looked at this part of the document very well, so I don't know exactly how the EP described it. But this is not an issue of confounding. This is an issue of exposure or misclassification. So I think we need to be clear about that as well. And a lot of the issues that Mark iterated on that I had that are in the consensus statement on the health appendices are also um, related to the notion that this isn't an issue of confounding. Okay. And uh, um... I'm going to skip for a minute over Brisa and see if Mark, you wanted, did you want to make, were you, was your point related to this or something else? It, yeah, it, it was on two points. One, I was going to raise that issue of that word confounding too in that sentence, because I, I don't, I was, and I was trying to find where it was referring to it in that document right there. It refers to page 275 that I'm trying to look over quickly, but what was the other section that Phil was mentioning where this was described? I just want to make sure I'm looking in the right place. Was it 2352? Uh, well, let's see, Peter mentioned the kinetics, but I'm not sure that's the point that we're um, addressing right now. It, it, Phil mentioned the variability, that's on line 35 of our report. I don't know where, what part. Right, I thought it was in the ISA itself where, where we're talking about this. I mean, I agree with, I think, Brian's point that I think the sort of general, uh, my suspicion is the general description of the kinetics in bone and different types of bone is probably well described, but sort of then the implications in a study, maybe not. But I just want to make sure I was <laughs> I was identifying the place we were referring to. I, I, I think they said page 275, or that's what's indicated there. And I don't know if that was the section that was just referred to about that, but... Um, but anyway, I, I was going to look it over to see where this word confounding was really coming from, because that was giving me some pause, too, uh, as Susan was mentioning. Yeah, uh, I'll just weigh in. I think that's a good um, uh, word uh, catch there. And uh, I think the main point was just, uh, you know, it can impact the interpretation of the epidemiological study. So I, I, um, I, I do agree that. Uh, using a different word choice there would be more appropriate. So we'll, we'll, uh, we'll go ahead and edit that. Okay, does that address this issue? Uh, and Aaron, I guess you have, um, you have the page 2-75 of the document up. Is that what we're seeing in front of us now? Yes. Yeah, thank you. Uh, so what I'm hearing is that uh, probably under Phil's leadership, we're going to address the, the word confounding in the paragraph on page line nine that starts on line 28. Uh, and that is the main change in addition to this broad change that we talked about, about clarifying uh, when we mentioned bone lead that um, that if we're talking about something specific that we talk about the, the, the source of the measurement, the bone source, that's what I understood. Those are the two big things that I've heard for this appendix. Um, thank you. Uh, Brissa. My comment is not about kinetics. It's, an, it's a different issue. Is that okay? 
Oh, absolutely. We're moving, we're moving on, right? Okay. Uh, um, still on appendix two. We have correct. A, yeah. Okay. Yeah. I have a comment on appendix two. Actually, I have a comment on page eight of our document, of our letter, of our response uh, review. <laughs> uh, on page five, sorry, page eight, line five, there's a paragraph that begins with the following areas could be rewarded or reorganized. Mm -hmm. I would like to propose an addition to that paragraph, and the addition is that, is that um, section 2.1.5.4 uh, that describes race ethnicity disparities in exposure needs some reorganization because it currently conflates uh, residential, racial, residential segregation and other characteristics of place, um, like urbanicity, for example, uh, with individual level race ethnicity. I can send you a sentence on that if you would like. That would be excellent. Um, and that's probably sufficient for our deliberation. Yeah. Uh, thank you. Uh, okay. Um, so we're still on appendix two. Any additional points? Um, we've got this uh, confounding word that we're going to address. We've got the, um, the whole point about um, uh, bone lead and I'm looking further down. We haven't gotten it. This is actually this pair, uh, section goes all the way to the top of page 11 and I see Mark Frampton had a comment on page 10, which we actually hadn't gotten to yet. So I'm wondering if uh, we're ready to move on. Uh, first, I see Kathy has her hand up. Okay, my, my comment is on page 10 as well. Okay, go ahead. Um, so, uh, and it probably follows what, uh, <laughs> Dr. Fr uh, Frampton is um, about to say, so maybe he should go first. <laughs> <laughs> All right, go ahead, Mark. Uh, okay, um, yeah, page 10, line 20, it's, it's really a minor issue, but uh, uh, so this paragraph just says, you know, that they're using different units are being uh, used um, in, in various measurements and it gives an example but I think the example is incorrect. Um, it's saying that uh, um, something is described as having a steep slope. However, the slope is based on micrograms per liter of blood and therefore not comparable to slopes based on micro, micrograms per deciliter. Uh, and of course, that's not true. Uh, if you're uh, just changing the unit of, uh, of uh, one axis, as long as you're, you know, as long as it's not logarithmic or something is not going to change the uh, slope. So maybe either can just get rid of the example here and leave it as the one sentence or use a different example. All right. Uh, and Kathy, did you want to follow up on that? Yeah, I the, the uh, yeah, I'd like to change the emphasis. I mean, the, the real emphasis of this and the I agree that the example is not really getting at the, the, the point. And the point is, is the use of different units, the clarity in um, using those units, but also the three examples in the occupational cohorts are really three different exposure scenarios. And as I look back, the comparability um, between them is, is uh, daunting, you know, to try and change units, change metrics, change um, what needs to be uh, looked at to make it comparable. And so I'm offering some um, different uh, language to try and clarify that. And you I have, like that. If you have it drafted, go ahead and read it to us. Um, well, in the, in the section in the, um, draft ISA, it talks about difficult to compare um, ambient air exposures and occupational exposures. And I'd like to, to uh, 
add that um, it's difficult to compare occupational and not, well, it starts off by saying difficult to compare occupational and non-occupational exposure populations. And then I, I want to add. Sorry, um, where are we? Oh, I'm sorry. This, this was in the um, section in the integrated science draft. And so just, you're talking now about some text in the ISA that you want to then propose some edits to our consensus comments that address yes. text, yes. right? So you're summarizing yes. right now the ISA text. Uh, and just where in the ISA are you <laughs> Mark, talking about so which section, paragraph? I'm sorry, it's section um, 2.5.2.2, occupational cohorts. What page? And that's on page of the document. It's page 2-109. And if you have the PDF up, people can find it easier by looking at the top what PDF page it is. And it's lines three, three through nine. Or I mean, sorry, six through six through nine. And I'm sorry, where in the letter are we? Oh, <laughs> that was your question. Oh, I think we're still on page 10 of the letter, the paragraph that starts on line 18 that had your highlighted um, uh, sentence on line 20. I, th I think that's still the same section, right, Kathy? Yes, yes. Yeah. So are the comments you're proposing, is, are they talking about the Pierre et al. study then? I'm talking about that all three studies that 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 they're use the ISA is using those ex three studies they picked out those three studies as examples of occupational studies um, that are have different exposure scenarios and then they give a summary slope factors or slopes and I went back to those three studies and <laughs> After, after doing the adjustments for uh, log log regression versus natural log regression versus um, you know several other versus metrics being change in blood lead versus blood lead level um, and and several other unit changes, I I you know I was challenged in finding. Um, the ability to compare these these three very different exposure scenarios. So what I wanted to to emphasize was the fact that in these in these three studies, there's they're very different exposure scenarios, and potentially not even comparable because of the different units that are used. And I think that speaks to you know, a, an earlier point that was made about um, more monitoring for research purposes and looking at spatial differences in exposure, not necessarily uh, related to compliance, but just trying to get a handle on spatial differences, which is, you know, different exposure scenarios. So, <clears throat> you know, I, I just, I have a rough draft and I need to run it by my, my other ex appendix two um, reviewers. And I'd like to be able to do that between, I can read it to you, but I'd like to be able to re um, revisit how to, how to make that point of comparability based on, on just different exposure met metrics, different exposure scenarios. So, okay. That's helpful. And uh, I guess uh, we can get the pleasure of the panel if people would like to hear your rough draft, or we can just circle back to this tomorrow uh, after you vetted the draft. That would be the other thing we could do. So you, you want, so you, so, well, it's not very long. So do you want me to read it? Go ahead and read it. And if we need to circle back, maybe that's more efficient. And if we, uh, we can certainly wordsmith it offline if the intent is clear. 
Uh, and uh, if the intent is not clear and we need to deliberate on it again tomorrow, we'll circle back. How about that? Okay. Okay. So um, what I added um, after the wording uh, ending on uh, line nine of the ISA, where it says, uh, difficult to compare occupationally and non occupationally exposed populations. I want to add a, um, a comment that addresses this. Um, I'm so, can as, I interrupt again? I'm so sorry. So, are you wordsmithing the ISA or the report? Well, this would be comments on the ISA that but would I'm, be. Included. I'm just wondering where this is going to go in the report that we're working on. I mean, we're not change. We can't change the ISA specifically. Or are you? Are we putting in a suggested text change in the ISA? Oh, that's, I see. That, that's. I'm sorry. Yes, that's exactly right. I got gotcha. you. What right. I'm suggesting. So, so you. So it might be worded in the letter. We recommend recommend the following text change on page such and such. Right. Yes. Yes. Okay. Okay. Yeah. okay great. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so um, the additional text change we recommend, um, as with non-occupationally exposed populations in different geographic locations near versus remote sources of lead um, in, in contamin uh, lead contaminated air, it is difficult to compare occupationally exposed cohorts. A few, and then a few occupational studies as um, stated in the uh, section that I mentioned, the ISA uh, draft, um, Rodriguez measures the change in blood lead over a two week exposure in air concentrations where uh, it's respirator corrected. Um, the exposures are respirator corrected. Pierre has, um, looks at workers with long job exposure um, of 10 or more years and no mention of workers wearing masks. And Lay um, looks at workers um, with between six months and three to four years of job, job tenure and a mix of workers wearing masks or not. So those are, two very, those are three very different exposure scenarios. And in addition, different units such as milligrams per meter cube versus micrograms per meter cube, micro, micrograms per, per liter versus micrograms per deciliter, log 10 versus natural log regressions are all factors um, in enabling the reader to reproduce and verify the reported results. I think a table with footnotes providing these differences is needed or we think I should say, <laughs> but that's that, that, I mean, that's my, my contribution. Thank you. So um, you have a few people you can consult with offline and unless anybody has any uh, further deliberations on that, I think um, that's something we can add to the, the document. I think it would go, it sounds like it would go on the uh, page 10, the paragraph that starts on line 18. It would be integrated into that paragraph is what I think I understood. Uh, and Mark, you had some follow-up comments. Yes, uh, just a suggestion that um, maybe um, that the specific edit that we're, you're suggesting for the ISA could be in your individual comments and we could uh, summarize the point here in, in this paragraph. Uh, the, you know, I think you're making an important point and we could summarize this difficulty in comparing these studies that needs a better treatment for, for a suggestion of a text change. See uh, Dr. Ex, uh, sub, you know, individual comments um, rather than prescribing the specific text that, that yeah. would be a little unusual for us to do that in, in the report. No, you're absolutely right. Thank you for that, Mark. Um, uh, that's a really good suggestion. So 
um, uh, Kathy, if you can integrate that into your individual comments, the specific wording, feel free still if you want to vet it with your colleagues. I don't see any harm in that, but it would go in your individual comments. And then what we need to really vet with ourselves, and I think we have the intent so we can wordsmith it offline. Uh, what we need to make sure is that we figure out the sentence, or maybe it's two, that goes in this paragraph that summarizes that broad point that you're making with the very specific text change that you want to make. So I think that's yeah. it. Yeah, thank you. That 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 was the intent was to um to edit my individual comments and then to work with my colleagues on appendix that reviewed appendix two to come up with a summary and suggested edits for the uh, report. Okay, thank you. Uh, thank you, that's helpful. All right, so we are uh, close to the end of appendix two. So uh, any further comments on any text in Appendix 2? I don't think I saw any other comments being submitted in advance. Anything else that people wanted to bring up about the text? So this goes from line 25 on page 7 all the way down to uh, line two on page 11. So we are ready to move on from that. I think we are, and we're almost two hours in and uh, appendices three through 10 will be another meaty topic. So I recommend we take a five minute break before we launch into that. So uh, somebody will put up the timer and we'll see you back in five minutes.
All right, timer says five minutes are up. People ready to get started again? All right, we had, uh, we're working uh, now on page 11 and uh, we had, this is all the health chapters together. We had uh, some broad comments, a summary table, and then some specific appendix as appendix specific comments. So we'll start on the the broad comments and uh, looking through it. Uh, let's stick with. Uh, the introductory section and our comments on uh, study limitations, specifically humor, um, exposure assessment and exposure biomarkers before we move on to the rest of it. And I saw Mark, you, I don't think Aaron made it public, but I saw you had sent in, I think it was last night, was it yesterday? Yes, yeah, sorry, very late. We, that's fine. It's uh, actually easier for me that you said it in before now. So I appreciate it. Uh, do you want to just uh, word uh, read out loud your suggested rewording to the A? Uh, sure. So uh, you're you're on page eleven, line twenty six. Is that right? I am. Thank you for that. Sure. So this is just about the tooth lead. Just to be. Clear, I was suggesting a rewording to, so this is lines 26 through 28. Um, what it really has to do with the last part of that sentence that says rather than as a biomarker of prenatal, early natal, postnatal exposures. I'm, I'm proposing rewording to tooth lead levels are sometimes mischaracterized as reflecting exposures that occurred at the time of their collection, e.g., ages six to eight years, period. The timing reflected by lead in teeth, that, that should be depends. <laughs> on what part of the tooth is being analyzed. While circumpulpal measures can reflect exposures around the time of loss, more typical analyses of enamel and dentin reflect the time those parts of the tooth formed that are more prenatal and early postnatal exposures. Thank you. And this also gets at uh, the one of the points that we discussed earlier, which is uh, this idea of, of the details matter and how things are measured. So yeah, thank you for that. Sure. Um, any other comments on the exposure assessment and biomarkers? I, I mean, I had a couple others in that document I sent you that were somewhat minor. Um, I, I, I wasn't sure whether they were too minor, just be considered. You know. Yeah, I put them. Um, yeah. So the next one, the next one you had was in the confounding section, at least. Oh, sorry. On. Sorry. Is that right? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> we can go on to that. If, uh, why don't you go ahead? Wait, so the confounding section, sorry, just to be clear, where are we on the, oh, and confounding. Yes. I see what you're saying. Right, right, right. So sorry. confounding starts on page 11, line 40 and goes through page 12 on line five. And you, I highlighted lines four and five on page 12 is uh, where you wanted to suggest an edit. Yeah. I was just suggesting to put an indication of what led exposure time period we were talking about in these examples. So they, it says now examples include adjusting child health, outco health outcomes for birth outcomes. And I'm suggesting that in that context, we should be saying in a study of prenatal lead exposures, which I assume is what's implied. And then for the second part of it, adjusting adult psychological outcome for psychotropic medication use, it, it matters that we're talking about, you know, earlier lead exposure. So just some indication. There. So yeah, Mark, that's correct. Do you want to make those changes? Sure. Yeah. I mean, I proposed wording in what I. I okay. Well, I didn't. I didn't see what you sent. So. No, I'm sorry. They didn't get around. I didn't propose wording. I just. I, I'm just. My point is to add the timing of the exposure here. So I, I'm happy to propose wording for that. I mean, I yeah. guess I said. Uh, yeah, I didn't propose wording, but I mean, I, I somehow we get in that you know in, in the birth outcome adjustment thing. It's it's that matters if it's prenatal lead we're talking about. So I'm, I was suggesting making that indication. I, I'm happy to, I don't know what the best process is here. Should I just come up with language for it and send it to you? Yeah, that's the best process. That would be great. Um, and Aaron and uh, um, 
feel free if you want to include a couple other panelists, you're welcome to do that as well. Uh, but we've talked about it now, so uh, people will weigh in if they have anything they want to say in addition to that. <laughs> so I, I'm thinking we can move on to the study design, which is also on page 12. Uh, and it starts on line seven and ends on line 28. And uh, Mark, you also had a comment here, according to my notes. Yeah, that's right. So lines 26, 27, and, and I may have written this <laughs> this part originally, but I realized over rereading it that I, I didn't like it. But um, it, it's referring to interactions and what happens if they are, I think the text of the ISA, we're commenting that they often say it's a limitation if they don't account for the interactions, but we're trying to point out that if you don't account for them and they're there, what happens, right? What you're gonna see. And what we had said was that um, the, in addition, if interaction ex exists, not including in the model often does not create a spurious association with lead, but rather would weaken the overall association. And then it says, this is the case if the interaction is one that makes an adverse effect worse. I, I, in rereading that, I think that's sort of not the right way to describe it. So I, I think what I would say instead was, um, in addition, if interaction exists, not including the model often does not create a spurious association with lead, but rather would weaken the overall association relative to the association in the more vulnerable group, i.e. the interaction would imply differences in the effect of lead by some other factor, and the overall association would be less than that in the group with the stronger effect. Because the, the point is, if there's an interaction, it means some people are having more of an effect and others are having less of an effect. And so the overall is going to be, overall, will look less than the stronger of the two effects by the two intera the interaction levels. I don't remember where this language came from, Mark, but I think what you just read sounds great. Okay, well, that's I put that in what I sent to you and Aaron, Leanne. Yeah. Yeah, okay, so we will make that change as well. So that is uh, replacing the uh, text, uh, the wording on uh, line 24 through 28 on page 12 with uh, the revised wording that is uh, makes the point more clearly. So uh, whoever wrote it first doesn't matter. We'll just get it, try to get it clearer now. So, um, I think anything else on page 12 or up through the end of page 12 for these overarching comments? We'll move on to the, uh, the next part of our overarching comments, which were on um, <clears throat> page 13, the determination of causality. Let's see, we have Oh, wow, there's 10 points on across two pages. Can we handle all of that in our discussion? Anyone have anything they want to mention on the determination of causality? I, I actually, my notes say that Mark had something he wanted to say uh, about point number seven, and I also was concerned about that. I uh, wanted to make sure we discussed that recommendation. So go ahead, Mark. Sure, and before I uh, mention my comments, I just wanted to um, state my appreciation to the panel for all the work you've done. I'm looking at this document as a, a Chartered Case Act member that did not participate in the uh, deliberations of the panel, and that's obviously you've all done a lot of uh, work and thoughtful consideration uh, looking at the ISA, and I, I learned a lot uh, reading this document. I, I uh, have not read all of the ISA, uh, so I'll confess that. But uh, my point, my only concern with the causation section in Id is item number seven. Um, KSAC recommends considering positing a hierarchy of human versus animal evidence in causality determinations. And uh, I'd like to suggest we avoid that making that recommendation or at least uh, significantly rewording it. I don't, I don't, I think such a recommendation could have unintended consequences. Um, I don't think anybody on the panel would, would think that a, uh, a poor quality human study 
should uh, be considered above a you know a poor quality human study that doesn't answer uh, the questions that that need to be answered um, would should have preference over an, a well conducted animal study that provides new evidence on a toxicological pathway for for one of the health endpoints. So. I think we want to avoid this blanket statement. Uh, I, I suspect where it's coming from is there's some place in the ISA that we think that uh, uh, the, the evidence has been misinterpreted, that inappropriate weight has been placed on animal versus human evidence. And I think we should point out that specific instance where we disagree with the weighting uh, of, the, of the evidence that we have. But, uh, I suggest we be specific and not make it a blanket statement. Yeah, and I was concerned that this was stated as a recommendation also. That's very strong. That that tells EPA, you know, CASAC says you must do this. And I and uh, uh kind of along with Mark's comments, I think that's probably too that's too strong. <laughs> there there certainly would be nuances to this for various reasons. So I, I think the question uh, on the table, as I heard it, is do we strike this whole point or do we weaken it? And, and Mark, I, I guess I didn't hear clearly from you whether uh, if you have a preference for one of those two. Well, it, it, it sort of that discussion leads into my other more general comment about the, the causality stuff. And I was going to get into this in my comments on table fifth, uh, table on page 15 there, but uh, maybe it's more appropriate to comment it now. In the places where we don't agree with the EPA's causality term determinations, there doesn't seem to, to be enough justification for that in the text of the report. And, um, and I think Steve Dutton commented on that, that we need to justify where we disagree on these causality de determinations. And uh, I think it should be summarized in the text of the letter. We could, if it's more clearly hashed out in some of the individual comments, we could refer to those individual comments, um, but we need to point out specific areas. Uh, is there new evidence that uh, wasn't in the ISA that is pushing us in that direction? Are there specific studies that didn't get enough emphasis? And item number seven suggests, well, maybe there is an inappropriate emphasis on some parts of the literature versus other parts, whether it's human versus uh, animal evidence, but that doesn't come across in, in this report. Uh, table, the table uh, on page 15 uh, is a very good idea, and it, it lays out these causality determination differences in our recommendations, but I don't find um, the specifics of the basis behind that um, in the report. So this is not as easily fixable as some of these uh, text edits that, that we're doing, but I, I, that's the bigger point that I wanted to make. Yeah, so that's an important point. Uh, and I, uh, you know, I, we, we were somewhat challenged at the meeting in the sense that uh, the way we did the assignments, a couple of people got all the chapters and, and other people got just a couple of uh, health chapters. And, and uh, I know there was a lot of thoughtful work done, but uh, a couple of people were pretty overloaded. Uh, and, and then uh, I added this table so, because I felt like it was really hard to follow all the different endpoints and be clear on, on uh, what we were saying. But, but we do need to make sure that our recommendations are uh, substantiated in our text that follows. So that's really important. Uh, Bruce. Yes, thank you. Uh, I'm not um, trying to support line seven. I think it's fine if we delete that. Um, but an example that, that I thought uh, was worth raising, uh, Steve Dutton mentioned that um, the outcomes on some of the pregnancy outcomes, for example, preterm birth and preeclampsia uh, may not be supported. And I don't know if he was specifically talking about those two, but those are the two that we suggested elevating the causality 
because uh, we didn't see that evidence or EPA didn't see that evidence in the toxicologic literature. And, and it seems to me if you see consistent evidence, say from meta-analyses um, and uh, epidemiologic studies, whether the evidence is consistent with the toxicologic literature. And just to be sure, I don't know the toxicologic literature. I do know the human literature. Um, it, it doesn't seem to me that we would necessarily downgrade the causality uh, interpretation if the human evidence is quite consistent. So um, maybe that's just a, a an example, a suggestion that we uh, could use for discussion purposes. Well, one point we could uh, on point, sticking with point seven for the moment, uh, we could soften that language and, and maybe bring in your um, uh, example uh, as one way of, uh, I mean, uh, the point and certainly other um, air pollution health endpoints have uh, struggled with this over time and addressed this as well, where the evidence is pretty much driven by the human studies and the animal evidence just isn't there. Uh, but that doesn't mean that the causal conclusion should be weakened. So that that maybe is is um, maybe we should just uh, uh, reframe this um, point seven to uh, address that point. And, and also I would suggest weakening it from recommends because there are you know, the, the individual cases, um, certainly uh, how one weights things would, would um, you know, a, a strict hierarchy could get you in trouble as Mark said. Christina. Yes, so just thinking about how, um, Leanne, you just said that there were so many different um, recommendations or suggestions with regards to the, the calls of determinations. Are all of these that are listed at the table actual recommendations or some of them suggestions? Because then we can spend our time maybe talking more about those that are really strongly recommended versus those that are suggestions. So my understanding of what the table was intended to do was any outcome where we reached a different conclusion than uh, what was in the ISA is in the uh, table. That said, some of them aren't really about changing the causality, but more uh, some other aspect of our recommendation. Mm -hmm. That was the intent of the table. So. So anything where the, the EPA's causality determinations, where we had some comments that suggested something needed to be done is in that table. That was the intent of the table. Does that answer your question? Sort of, I see how there are differences because there are some like for preterm birth separate that outcome instead of grouping it with the other outcomes. But I was just wondering if the, if it was the same strength in terms of suggestion versus a recommendation. And it sounds like there's probably a mix. Oh, I see what you're saying. Uh, Cause the heading says KSAC recommendation and you're thinking some of Right, them and then also in, yeah. in 10, it says these are the recommendations. So the recommendations are you really should change these versus suggestions are consider. It just might help with, with talking uh, if we yeah, know. Okay, so we, we can certainly in the table, we can say recommendation or suggestion to make that clear. And then we can make it clear specifically uh, with each one. Uh, okay, we can certainly do that. Uh, Michelle. Yeah, just uh, following up on your earlier question about deleting the text or weakening it. I agree with you that I think a weakening of it is uh, is appropriate. I like that. And also just to follow up on what Christina was saying, I really like this comment that you had, Christina, about us distinguishing between recommendations and suggestions. I know like in kind of common conversational uh, discussions, I don't think there's a lot of difference in that word wording, but I think for a written document, there is. It's really of different connotations. And I think that this is our opportunity to really help prioritize 
for EPA, the things that we are, you know, we are recommending versus things we are suggesting. So suggesting. So I really like that distinction. Yeah, and and uh, just to emphasize, that is an important distinction that we uh, do try to make, and um, uh, so uh, we definitely need to um, make it clear in the table and elsewhere when we're t making a recommendation versus a suggestion. Mark. You know what might be helpful um, is to, under the, the CASEC advice or recommendation column, to reference the part of the letter or report that provides the background for this. Uh, yes. And, and it might require some shifting of the, of the report or uh, adding some specifics, but uh, um, as it comes across, these, these kind of just seem to come out of nowhere. Um, and, uh, and, you know, some at least of this is, is covered in the, in the letter and we could, reference back to that. But I do think that the report needs to provide some specifics uh, about why for these for these outcomes where we're recommending at least uh, a change in the causal determination, we need to be clear about how we differ uh, or why EPA has misinterpreted this evidence. Okay, so we can certainly add to the table our uh, like where our recommendation details are, or we could put uh, some text in advance that says it's in the section for that outcome because that's where it came from. <laughs> Uh, so we cover, as we will, as we go through, each appendix has a different outcome. And so, uh, and these were drawn, um, because I put this together, uh, you know, these were drawn from what we said in the rest of the report. Um, what, what, so we, but we could add that to the table just for clarity. I don't see any problem with that. I also think, for instance, on the first row, which we are recommending uh, causal, not likely causal, uh, just following uh, Christina's comment, we, you know, we can add the word recommend causal. And then some of the other things haven't gotten there in terms of uh, thinking through it. Uh, maybe we add the word suggest. So every every place um, will both change the heading and every row in the row, we will make it clear whether it's a recommendation or a suggestion. But this table is meant to be a summary of what is in the document. And we can also make that clear. Um, uh, uh, Susan. Yeah. So, I mean, when I put this table together for you, I went back and forth with the other people who read these appendices since I was the lead author on almost all of them. And this was sort of the consensus. And I guess it was very hard to get people to respond. So I think if we want to qualify each of these as a recommendation versus a suggestion, we need to do it in real time because I just think it's too hard to get people to respond by email. No, oh, absolutely. And, we had to I, do it in public anyway. Okay. And I think the other thing in response to Mark's comments is that um, a lot of these, for the most part, and others can chime in, most of these recommendations or suggestions were a consequence of members of the committee, myself included, feeling like the literature summary in the ISA um, supported a different causal determination and interpretation than the EPA's interpretation. So it's not necessarily the case that one, there was a study missing from the ISA or um, additional literature that needed to be considered, but that the, the body of literature, which was very nicely summarized in the AS, ISA, led some of us to feel like the conclusion should have been different. Um, so, I mean, I think not maybe not 100%, but the, the, the references for which these different recommendations or suggestions are coming from are based on the sections in the ISA that discuss each of these health outcomes. So my suggestion is in terms of moving forward, trying to navigate this, 
that we not try to vet this table now specifically, but in each chapter that has the relevant row or rows, as it depends, that we, you know, make sure that the, the, the edits to the table are agreed upon as we talk about each specific outcome. Because you're absolutely right, Susan, we have to do this in public. We can't do this. I mean, this has to be, this is like the, 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 the crux of the work that we're doing is these recommendations uh, and, and also for the, uh, the ecological effects. So we have to be clear on our recommendations and, or suggestions. And, um, and they do have a very different interpretation uh, by the EPA. Uh, there's a very strong distinction. And uh, uh, I've been on other panels where we've had other discussion. The word should is the same as KSAC recommends, uh, whereas could is KSAC suggests. Again, you know, we haven't gotten into those details in this, but that's the, that is also, uh, as we're working on the document, just to bring that to your attention. Uh, but that distinction is, is very important. And we will, um, <clears throat> so, so I think each row of this table, we will add the word recommend or suggest and, uh, and so that that's clear and we'll go through each one. Uh, coming back to um, the causality, I want to make sure that we finish that, that there's no other changes other than what I heard. Number seven, we're going to change recommends to suggest, and Bruce is going to help us craft a little bit of text uh, that helps with the the idea of the of the waiting. I think is what the, what your point was, and and the existence of yeah the relative waiting. Okay, is that okay? Um, okay, so um, there were other comments from uh, Mark and uh, Steve Dutton about uh, specific rows of the table. But I recommend that we not address those now, but we come back to them as we need to. So that would suggest we're moving on to Appendix 3, Nervous System Effects, on page 15, starts on line 3, and goes, um, well, it goes all the way down to um, page uh, 17 on line 31, but that may be a little bit more for us to do, too much to do. So why don't we start with the bottom of page 15 through uh, 16 um, and uh, any comments there, Cora, Deborah. Yeah, hi, I, I my comment uh, is on the bottom of page 16, what are the panel's view on the integration of evidence from mechanistic studies? Uh, and it states there that there's one suggestion for supplementing this, which would be the toxicological literature, uh, particularly in vitro studies. Um, I, I personally uh, am not in favor of including that for a couple of different reasons. One, a lot of the in vitro studies uh, have used high levels of lead exposure that I don't think are relevant to uh, human exposures. Um, it also sort of forces us into the whole argument of how valid uh, the assay is that you're gonna be talking about um, and whether or not the chemistry of lead in the in vitro situation is at all similar to what would happen in a human situation. Um, and so I, I would not be in favor of including that particular suggestion. So are you suggesting just striking that entire sentence that is on line 40 through 43? Yes, to the extent that it considers in vitro, because it's a little confusing, it says mechanistic or other experimental literature. I, I wasn't clear what exactly that meant. Mechanistic could be a toxicological in vivo study or other experimental literature could be an in vivo study. So I wasn't sure what actually those were referring to. 
the the one that particularly stood out to me was this inclusion of in vitro. Okay, thank you. Um, others with expertise on this topic have uh, helped us figure out exactly how we want to edit this text. Debbie, I thought that language came from you, so I don't even know where it came from. <laughs> <laughs> so I, I had just one clarification point about this sentence. If it were to stand, obviously, if it leaves totally, it doesn't matter. But the parenthetical, e.g., equivalent to less than 30 micrograms per deciliter in blood, is that supposed to be a greater than? Because otherwise, that sentence doesn't, I don't understand. It seems I, implying that the levels are quite high and then it refers to less than 30, so. Yeah, I mean, Mark, I think I took this from individual comments that people mentioned during our deliberations. So. Um, so maybe it would be. At least so I, 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 did, I don't know where this came from, to be honest, but I thought this was in someone's individual comments and we talked about it during deliberations, which is why. I put it as part of our consensus. But yeah, I guess I would say for the for it to make sense with the rest of the sentence, it should either be up to 30 or greater than 30. I don't know what the literature is, but I mean less than 30 could be quite low. So I think if the issue is that it's up to 30, that's kind of high. Yeah. But maybe the less than just needs to be replaced by an up to. Mark. Yes, just reading this uh paragraph. I mean it seems to me the gist of the paragraph is that uh, the toxicological literature is using mostly higher exposures and uh, the writer here wants consideration of uh, studies with lower exposures. But um, unless we know of some studies with, you know, toxicologic studies with lower exposures, um, it seems like a uh, an empty wish here that uh, that just the literature is not there. So uh, to me, um, maybe this whole paragraph should be changed to say that we point out that uh, the toxicologic literature is using um, perhaps uh, uh, levels that are uh, not relevant to uh, current ambient exposures. I don't know how well the ISA makes that point, but uh, I would definitely support taking out the, the in vitro recommendation. But I read this section not specifically suggesting more in vitro studies are needed, but that the issue is that uh, the toxicology is using higher exposures. And uh, the question is the relevance to uh, to uh, human health effects at lower exposures. And so I think either the paragraph should be changed or uh, eliminated. Susan. Yeah, I, I, I think I, your point is a good one, Mark. I think the issue here was integration. And I think the issue was that integrating human studies at lower exposures than the mechanistic studies, however you define those, requires a little more care since a lot of the mechanistic studies are at exposures that are no longer necessarily relevant. So it's an integration issue, like how do you integrate discrepant exposure levels in understanding risk? Um, and was the sense that the ISA didn't do that integration adequately? They didn't do it in some cases as well as they could have there. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So yeah, maybe this could be um, edited in just the way you suggest that uh, saying that, that reconciling the dosage differences between toxicologic studies and, uh, and uh, human studies requires uh, more consideration, something like that. Okay, that sounds like a good change, uh, and we can we can wordsmith the details offline. Uh, I think we can move on to uh, the rest of this section, which goes all the way to uh, line thirty one on page seventeen. And I saw there were a couple of comments submitted in advance, uh, two from Mark and one from Brian. So does one of you want to weigh in on your comments? Was so mine I, about uh, being specific about the neurodegenerative disease categories? 
Um, I, I, I haven't pulled up my document. Yeah, no, yours was about number. Yes, it was neurodegenerative disease. And you said if we're going to rec recommend causal determination for separate neurodegenerative disease, we may want to provide some guidance on what we might support. And I think that's consistent with the conversation we've already had sort of about the table and supporting our uh, recommendations. I mean, the uh, table just says we should, it just uses a neurodegenerative disease category as one big category. And I think we should be specific about what we think the evidence suggests for each of the specific neurodegenerative diseases. Yeah. If we're going to do this. Yeah, and well, it says consider. So consider is in the class, like suggest. That means, you know, something to think about for EPA, but not like you have to do it. Uh, so if that's, uh, but we could still be more specific about uh, what we think. Uh, we'll certainly edit the table to say uh, consider. Oh, it does say already consider. So that is that is a weak a weak recommend a weak <laughs> piece of advice. Let me put it that way. Um, so, are you thinking, Brian, uh, number four? That's on line twenty-two to twenty-six. That uh, you want to expand this and add some details? Is uh, do we have the ability to do that, or do we want to just um, well leave it as is? That it's something to look at further. I mean, my general feeling is that it's not so easy to do. And so we're recommending that they, that they consider the major neurodegenerative diseases separately. And I'm not so sure that, they, that we would all come to agreement about what the evidence suggests. Um, and so all I'm saying is if we're suggesting that they do it, we might want to talk a little bit among ourselves about what we think the, 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 the evidence is for each of these. Okay, and uh, not uh, sure that we're in a place to do uh, fresh deliberation right now. So that's an important point. I see a couple of people with their hands up. Maybe we can figure out how to help us navigate through this. Uh, Susan. Yeah, I mean, I was going to defer to Mark. So I'm curious because I think some Mark and Howard had some suggestions about specific disorders where the data or the literature on lead is more compelling, um, so. Yeah, I mean, I, I wasn't gonna necessarily go there and, and, and open up a deliberation of which is causal or not. And I, I thought I had recalled from our conversation that that there was also the, this suggestion might have applied to in the future, like we don't necessarily need to do it right now, but that this is something that down the line should be separated out. I, I don't know if people are comfortable with that or not. Uh, well, then, if people are comfortable with that, I think that the straightforward thing to do is because it sounds like there is some scientific basis for this, but it's not uh, easy to know how to resolve it, even with among ourselves or for EPA. So I like the idea of, of suggesting that it's an in the future thing to do, and we'll take it out of the table. Uh, does anybody have problems with that? Um, I think that's a good compromise given the, you know, where we are in the document. I think that's great. Okay. Uh, Mark, did you have something else you wanted to bring up or was that? Yes. Uh, and it's a oh. minor thing. It's just item number three on that page, line 19, page 17, line 19. I was just uh, struggling with understanding what the meaning is here. Uh, there is inherent variability across domains of cognitive function in adults. That's, uh, you know, don't argue with that. But considering the pattern of overall findings is likely more informative for causality determination. I don't know. Uh, there's obviously some background discussion for this, but what point is being made? It doesn't come across here. Mark Weisskopf. Yeah, I, I think that may have come from comments of mine, uh, and, and it relates to um, like ways, at least we, and I believe others too, have often analyzed this data. I mean, uh, the discussion was around people often look at very specific cognitive tests, and there's rationale to do that, and they you know, have different underlying mechanisms to some extent, but they also sort of get at a, all of them get at a kind of global cognitive function. So often we combine all of the tests in some way 
to get at a, a, a more general cognitive function assessment that sort of takes variability in all these different tests and kind of gets rid of some of it by combining and that that often is a more robust indicator. I think that's where this discussion, I think this text came from. Susan, I don't know if you... But is yeah. that a, is that a um, an issue for study design in the future or are we uh, suggesting that, uh, that EPA do something different in how wow. the ISA reviews these studies. Yeah, so I'm forget now I'm actually uh, correct Susan if you remember something let me know. I I think this came from some language that sounded a little bit from the ISA like oh but there's variability in all this testing and so they they sort of relegated the results to a little less convincing because there's sort of variation when you're looking at all the different cognitive tests and my point was there's a lot of inherent variability there. And so if you instead focus on times when they kind of group the tests in different ways, it doesn't necessarily look quite as inconsistent. And I feel like the, I, I recall that the language in the ISA kind of tended to downgrade this, this literature because they deemed it, you know, inconsistent, like one test shows something, another doesn't. But when you kind of look across them all, that tends to show something was the point I think I was making. Yeah. So okay, this the causality issue, Mark, you know, it's like the um, the ISA tended to, like Mark said, downgrade causal determinations if there was not perfect consistency across cognitive domains, which you wouldn't expect, rather than understanding cognitive domains in a broader context, which would be more appropriate for causality purposes. So I would just suggest that uh, uh, changing some wording. I mean, uh, your explanations are are very clear, and I think it's a very important point. And I would just uh, suggest expanding this paragraph to uh, to make that uh, clearer, because uh, I think it's a very important point, uh, and that this would be a case where uh, we disagree with how uh, EPA has interpreted the overall literature, at least the emphasis that they're placing on this aspect of the literature uh, could perhaps be adjusted and uh, and the variability is more expected in, in this aspect of the literature than, uh, than an indicator of, a, of, a, of gaps in the research. Okay, so that sounds like a good suggestion, and I'll um, I'll look to uh, Susan, Mark, and Mark, uh, and maybe a couple others to help us get the nail down the details of exactly what, how we want to edit this. Uh, but I think the point is made, uh, Bruce. Yeah, I want. Sorry to backtrack just a little bit. I wanted to go back to this recommendation, or maybe it's a consideration, but. Uh, I wanted to suggest that we stick with the idea of, uh, in the future, um, look at specific neurodegenerative diseases or pregnancy outcomes. And I want to suggest that we leave the future, but we recommend that in the future, they uh, look at specific neurodegenerative outcomes or pregnancy outcomes when the evidence is sufficient. The, the idea that you can group pregnancy outcomes as a whole makes no sense to me. The, the idea that you can group neurodegenerative diseases as a whole doesn't make any sense to me. Uh, but, but I don't think we need to ask them to do it now. But I would, I would encourage us to recommend that for the future as opposed to consider it in the future. Does that make sense? Okay, so you're, cha you're specifically, and this is an important change, uh, you're specifically saying on line 22 of this page that we will change the word consider to recommend and we will have already agreed to add in the future. So those will both get into this number four. Uh, uh, yeah, okay. if other people concur, yes. Yeah, Thank I'm you. seeing some heads nod, so that's helpful. And uh, nobody's objecting, so that's also helpful. Um, Brian. So this chapter has a change in the causality determination for adult cognitive function. So I wanted to respond to Mark Frampton's request that we explain and, um, and help Susan's request that uh, we, you know, sort of figure this out now uh, so that, uh, you know, we don't have to 
ignore your emails, Susan, although I don't think I ever ignore your emails. Um, <laughs> you didn't. <laughs> <laughs> um, and so, uh, so there's a paper by Regina Shee that was in Environmental Health Perspectives in 2007 that was notably co-authored by three Kasich lead panel members, me, Mark Weisskopf, and Howard Hugh, uh, on 21 studies in adults that measured both tibia lead and blood lead. Oddly, it's mentioned in chap Appendix 2, but it, I can't find it referenced in Appendix 3. I, I just did a search for the name she, S-H-I-H. That's a decent, I mean, I would have thought that that suggested a causal determination back in 2007, but we can follow that up with additional ones. I was a little bit surprised that that paper wasn't in here, but I thought there was enough other evidence, so I didn't make a big issue with it. But three Kasich <laughs> lead panel members co-authored that paper. That's a good place to start, Susan, if you want to explain how we came to this conclusion. Okay, and uh, thank you. And just so I and others can navigate specifically where in the appendix three text do we want to make sure we address this change in the causal conclusion? It sounds like you're suggesting that we add that reference, that ISA add that reference to that chapter to support that evidence. Um, so Leanne, I'm a little bit confused about what we're doing with the table. I thought you said we were going to discuss our, you know, um, kind of motivation and support for these causality determination changes in the individual appendix chapter. So it's referring to the word causal in the table, but I don't actually see, it, it's actually mentioned, I think in another place in the appendix three section, isn't it? It must be in there somewhere. I'm not finding it. If anybody- I'm looking at uh, number five, line 28 on page 17. Thank you, Mark. Um, okay. Uh, yeah, that's that, that'd be a good place to do it. Okay, so so Brian's suggestion is specifically uh, to strengthen our um, to strengthen our arguments by also saying the ISA should discuss the she paper she two thousand seven paper, um, and that should be part of point five. My, I'm not, I'm, so I'm, many I'm, large longitudinal studies of adult cognitive function with bone and blood lead now that uh, I mean I think it's among the area with the strongest evidence, maybe other than childhood neurobehavioral. One thing quickly about the sheet paper, I, I'm, I'm forgetting this, but something is rattling around in my head about a comment somewhere of EPA not looking at review papers, because that was a review paper, and that may be why they didn't include it in here. But um, I think we, at some point else, we have text that says, you know, those can be quite useful and the EPA to consider them. But that was a review paper, which may be why it somehow slipped out of that section. I don't know. Yeah, so, that, that, that was reviewed. But it's also before 2013. So it's from the previous ISA. So they're, you know, there's supposedly a summary of the previous ISA, but that literature is not necessarily as explicitly discussed. Although that's really inconsistent. I, and I said this yeah. in my earlier comments, you see yeah. all sorts of earlier stuff all over the place. It's very inconsistent regarding yeah. the use of yeah. prior evidence. Okay, is there uh, anyone, before we move to Mark, is there anyone from EPA that wants to make sure that we're not off on some wrong track about our comments about review papers? Um, if so, speak up now. Uh, Leanne, it was less important for me to reference that paper than to use that as a starting point for how we explain why we're changing this causality determination. Okay, okay. So it would be more, not so much that the ISA needs to reference the paper, but that this is part of our uh, strengthening. So, so what we need to do, I think in general is strengthen uh, point five, uh, which uh, in uh, part of what you're saying is that uh, we need to reference that paper as part of the evidence that we're using to justify our recommendation. Yeah, explain our recommendation, not strengthen it. Okay, thank you. Thank you for uh, clarifying my wording. Uh, and Mark. So yeah, on this, uh point about the causality of neurodegenerative disease. I did read the ISA section 
on that. Um, um, and uh, in my experience with the causality determinations, the kind of the difference between likely causal and causal is um, the, the remaining limitations in, in the data as it exists. And uh, in my read of the ISA section on this, they go through those limit, the remaining limitations as they see it. Um, and, uh, and that is why they did not uh, make this causal because they felt there were uh, a number of remaining limitations. Um, so we need to, if we disagree with those limitations, I think that needs to be addressed. Uh, but the other thing is, um, you know, we need to be cautious about attributing causality uh, based on epidemiology studies alone, um, unless the, the, you know, unless you've got a large body of consistent epidemiology that that covers, you know, that uses enough of different approaches to, uh, to assess the limitations that are inherent to those kinds of studies. And I, I'm not, I don't know this literature. So, um, so I think we need to go a little further in justifying why we think this is a causal determination here. And uh, I just was, and I would certainly defer to the panel, but did the whole panel was in consensus on this uh, upgrade in causality? Well, let Susan weigh in since she was really the lead on. Well, I don't know if you were, you probably weren't the lead on this chapter, but you certainly were the lead on all these. Uh, no, I was the lead on this chapter, Leanne. I was the lead on all but two chapters oh. for health effects. So, yeah. um, <laughs> Big lift. Big yeah, lift. so I'm yeah, feeling a little you. overwhelmed by all these recommendations because I just can't do it alone. But um, so so a couple things. As best I could ascertain, the people assigned to this chapter were in agreement about this particular consensus comment. Um, the, I mean, I think this is where the sort of complexity of the document and reviewing it comes to play. So oftentimes we found, or I found that the limitations enumerated in the ISA were not necessarily limitations. So the reason that we started the whole health effects section with some overview comments was to identify, um, identify issues with the analytical approach to the literature that apply to most of the appendices, if not all of them for health effects. And so in many cases, and I can't give you a specific granular review for this particular outcome, those enumerated limitations were probably not limitations. So issues such as inconsistency of effects across different cognitive domains, when in fact, those are expected variability and really not a limitation or issues around um, exposure biomarkers and what biomarkers were most appropriate for these particular outcomes were interpreted as a source of inconsistency when in fact, they're probably more a source of differences in appropriate exposure assessment. So in, in many cases where the ISA identified inconsistencies in the literature, I think the committee agreed that those were or problems with literature. Those weren't actually inconsistencies or problems. Um, so I, I think that's part of what motivated some of these change, changes in recommended or suggested causality, that the interpretation of the literature and its strengths and limitations was not always um, uh, appropriate from our perspective. Yeah, thank you. That's very helpful, Susan. And, uh, you know, I want to make sure to thank you uh, in public because you had an enormous lift. And uh, next time that uh, when Brian and I do, or not Brian, excuse me, Brian also did a lot uh, because he was also uh, 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 read all of these appendices. Uh, next time when Aaron and I do these assignments, we'll make sure that we spread the load a little bit. Um, one very helpful thing for those of you who did uh, faithfully read all the appendices was your ability uh, to bring forth these overarching comments, which I think were, were really helpful. We've already gone through those. And I think that this is an, a point and maybe part of what we do in this number five 
is uh, we say uh, we could we could add some more specifics, but it sounds like part of it is that that you know uh, the 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 main point is that limitations cited uh, weren't um, weren't what we consider actual limitations as noted in our overarching comments. So that would be maybe a, a somewhat of a straightforward, maybe a not enough detail. And that's something that I think both panelists and EPA should let us know before we stop deliberating in public, uh, because this is a very important point. This is, as I said, the crux of what we're doing. Uh, but I think that's one way that we can address uh, the, the, the fact that uh, the support for this. So Christina has her hand up. So we'll move to Christina and I would appreciate if, if uh, anyone has further comments on uh, how to edit number five or, or if you support my broad recommendation to just allude to the overarching comments. So I have a clarification question that I'm hoping maybe some of the staff from EPA or maybe you, Marx, is based on Mark's comment about the evidence that's necessary between like the causal and causal um, in terms of EPA's definition of those and where we could find that. I'm, I'm sure it's somewhere, but where can we can find all of those criteria, the level of evidence that distinguish between the levels? Um, I, I think my answer, and certainly EPA is more than welcome to weigh in, is that that should be in the ISA preamble. Yeah. So. And and that that at this point that document isn't really changing, which is why it's separate, and uh, it so it can be a little bit easy to skip because it's not the document we're assigned, but it's. It's like the basis for um, how we're thinking about what, the causality determinations. All right, so do we have a plan for moving forward that uh, we're mostly going to refer to our overarching comments in number five, Mark? So I, I uh, would love to see the specific um, comments added to this number five, just as was described a, a minute ago. Um, you know, the fact that these limitations were, we don't see these limitations in the same way that EPA has interpreted them because of X, Y, and Z. Um, and uh, it won't, you know, uh, can be done in a few sentences and also link it to the overarching comments. But I think we need to make our, to it's a big deal to change it to causal uh, or to recommend that it be changed to causal. And I think we really need to uh, justify it. And I think the, the biggest issue is how we're interpreting the limitations. All right, thank you. So we'll try to do that. Um, we'll need to, we may, uh, we may want to try to deliberate that in public tomorrow if we have the bandwidth to do that uh, in advance. I think that since this is so important, um, Brian. So hearing what Susan said and Mark said, if you go to 3614 in the ISA, that integrated summary of cognitive function in adults, I think it really is um, clear of what Susan said, that what they're calling limitations are not really limitations. And it's, it's actually, a, there are several places where it's written kind of strangely, where they say, we had all this evidence before, it was likely causal, and now there's recent stronger evidence, but we're still calling it likely causal. So uh, we could take a look at that and, and, and give specific um, uh, justification if, if requested. I think that would be super helpful. And uh, since other people have already had assignments, Brian, can you take the lead on that? Sure. When, when do you need it by? I'm going to San Diego on Saturday for a week. <laughs> well, um, if we could, I, I know this is a big ask, but if there was a sentence or two that we could talk about tomorrow, that would be awesome. Uh, but it sounds- I've got calls after this one until late. Yeah. <laughs> okay, okay. So if we can make, uh, it sounds like we have general agreement about how we're going to approach it. So I'm gonna just check with Aaron, is this okay? Or do we need to have more specifics? 
No, I think that was good. I think what Susan had described before um, with some specifics and pointing back to the summary, I think that's good enough. Okay, thank you. I just wanna make sure that we're not, um, uh, all right, and we'll we'll figure it out offline. If people aren't available, we'll, we'll, we'll make it work. Um, so next up, I think we're ready for appendix four. Uh, we, as uh, just to circle back to the table, we're adding the word recommend causal and uh, uh, for the table. And we'll make sure that it's clear that the, the supporting information is in the separate appendix text. So we're on to page 17, appendix four, starts on line 34, and it goes all the way to. Um, page 20, line 20. That's a lot of text. So maybe we'll start with the first page, a little over a page. So line seven, or excuse me, the bottom of page 17 through the bottom of page 18. Um, oh, somebody recommended uh, change to the wording on line seven. That's a wordsmithing. We'll get We'll take care of that. Um, and Mark, you had comments about uh, the paragraph starting on line 11. Uh, oh, starting on line 11. Um, well, yeah, actually this whole beginning section of cardiovascular okay. effects, um, this whole section that talks about effect modification, which I liked and uh, is uh, an effective statement of it. But to me, it comes across as not specific to cardiovascular effects. These comments seem relevant to epidemiological research in general uh, and in its interpretation anyway, uh, and would apply to uh, health outcomes beyond cardiovascular. Um, so I guess my only question is, is this the right place for these paragraphs or should they be in an overarching se section? Susan. Yeah, they are in the overarching section. So that was one of the things that Mark was talking about, Mark Weisskopf. So I don't know if it's better to just reference that or repeat it here. Um, yeah. Um, when when we discussed this uh, appendix in in the June meeting, um, I I vaguely remember, though I might be misremembering, that we mentioned some of these some of this text would be part of the overarching section, um, and you know we we provided it here as part of Appendix Four because that's when it first came up during the June meeting, but I think that if some of this is repetitive, it could be potentially moved to the overarching section uh, or reference like Susan uh, just mentioned. Okay, so it sounds like a solution to this is to um, to make sure that, uh, so, so to distill this probably in the overarching section. Um, uh, so Mark, do you, uh, have your hand up again, or is this uh, still up? Yeah, you're okay. But no, Brian, I'm done. Um, Brian, go ahead. So, so I agree that we should, you know, say something in the overarching section. But my recollection was that the cardiovascular literature had more effect modification studies than any other, uh, you know, appendix, and so. Uh, Mark Frampton, I, I keep saying your last name only because there's another Mark. Um, I, I think we should say something, you know, explicit here because it's really a huge problem in cardiovascular. And, and as far as I can tell, most of the studies that evaluated effect modification sort of did it exploratory. These these were not pre-specified analyses, and so. Um, I actually think a lot of the effect modification stuff in cardiovascular comes comes across to me at least as a little bit less uh, strong because it's it, we, it's unclear to me whether how much of this was pre-specified before their analysis. So if we're going to put a lot of this over there up front, I should I, I I think we should just say that this literature is particularly 
uh, rife or you know has a lot of uh, these kinds of studies. Yeah, that's valuable. So we won't certainly won't take all of it out of this. We'll make sure uh, we'll we'll look at how they go together and um, um, yeah. Mark. Yeah, and I, I that sounds fine. <clears throat> and I think if you just added a, a sentence or two about why we're discussing it here in the cardiovascular section, I think that would uh, um, just make it clearer. Okay. Susan. Yeah, I was just going to say, I just remembered, I mean, in the overarching section, it's more about exposure mixtures interacting, whereas I think this is more around susceptible subgroups. But I do think it's worth having a, an additional comment in the overarching section and then highlighting the particular importance of this method of an, analyzing data for cardiovascular disease outcomes. Okay, so it sounds like basically we need to make changes to both the overarching and to this section to both beef up the overarching to address the um, the susceptible subgroups and to um, also um, make it clear why we're we're going into more detail in this section. Susan, do you think that? Uh... Effect modification is always about susceptible subgroups. Sometimes it informs mechanistic thinking. No, no, I didn't mean to imply that was the only thing. I just, the way it's described in the overarching section is a little different than what is at play in the cardiovascular disease section. Okay. But that, that question that Brian just posed is also very important as to why the ISA considers effect modification as part of its review and and that there's a need for the ISA to explicitly state why they why they do that how these inform how how does the EPA think that effect modification analysis contribute to the causality determinations and they, they can be you know uh for many reasons, but I think that a statement is, is needed on that. And that's already here as part of the, the comments in the appendix four. Okay, so um, Brisa, maybe we can also look at how that might get into the overarching comments. I can help provide a, a sentence of uh, the links appendix four to the overarching section. So maybe suggest just a, a small, a sent, literally a sentence or two for the overarching section that references Appendix 4 in the more general context. And then I can maybe words, suggest some, some words smithing, smithing for Appendix 4 that um, makes it more specific, such as, you know, in the, the cardiovascular chapter uh, had by far the largest amount of results on effect modifications and uh, so forth. Um, so as to so as to indicate why the effect modification comments are concentrated in this appendix versus spread all over. Great, I think that would be helpful. Okay. Uh... Anything else uh, up through the end of page 18? Okay, moving on to page 19, at least down to the end of this section, which ends on line 35. Uh, I see Brian Schwartz uh, had a comment um about the discrepancies in the literature on associations of different bone lead sites uh so do we need and you, this was uh based on line starting on line six uh so i wanted to check and see if you had um, page 18 or 19 i'm sorry yes we're on page 19 now um line six Your comment said, I believe there are discrepancies in the literature on associations of different bone lead sites, patella versus tibia, with hypertension. More spe 
specificity and language is needed regarding what associations with these bone lead sites represent. Uh, and that was in addressing uh, page 19, line six, I, I had highlighted the sentence, the case act notes a, a need to acknowledge the exposure window reflected in exposure biomarkers, short-term or long-term exposure. It sounds like you may, maybe you were also addressing the entire paragraph. It sounds like maybe we need a little bit more elaboration in that paragraph. Is that what you were thinking? This goes back to my earlier comment where this mentions bone lead. And, and this is a little bit uh, of linking bone lead to specific health outcomes implying from a certain study. And all I'm saying is that if we're, every time we do that, we should say where the lead was measured. So this is not exactly referring back to a study, but a specific study, but um, I haven't tried to find this, but my recollection of this literature is that there are studies that report different associations of tibia and patella with cardiovascular outcomes. And, um, and that's where we need to explain how we interpret those, those, kinds of, uh, those kinds of studies. And I thought there was inconsistencies across studies too. But overall, you know, I don't think it's a huge deal because ca cardiovascular is a single causal determination and, uh, and there's lots of other evidence, you know, so I don't think it's a huge, it's a huge problem. I don't think it's going to change our overall conclusion. Okay, so how do you think we should edit this text or should we? I think, you know, based on the, the compromise that we reached earlier, this is not referring to a specific study. It's more general. So it's probably okay to say bone lead there. Okay. All right. So we don't, we can actually leave that this is okay because it's not a specific study. Susan. Yeah, maybe my comment's probably not relevant anymore. I mean, I think, you know, for example, Brian, in the work that we've done in Boston area populations, you know, like patella lead is more strongly associated with hypertension in women and tibia lead is more strongly associated with hypertension in men. And some of it may have to, you know, it's mostly postmenopausal women. It may have to do with mobilization and, and bioavailability in women versus men. But I, I sort of feel like that level of detail, I'm not sure what it contributes because I don't think it suggests inconsistencies in the bigger sense that it's still the case that it's bone, it's longer term exposure, not shorter term exposure that seems to be associated with hypertension. And then within longer term exposure, there's some variation depending on the biomarker. But I feel like that's a level of nuance that may or may not, you know, change the overall conclusion. So that seems consistent with, um, well, it seems consistent with the sentence um, that starts on, on line six, uh, needs, uh, notes a need to acknowledge the exposure window, short-term or long-term. And then I, the next sentence, uh, highlighting the strengths and our limitations of studies using a particular biomarkers association with a particular outcome, that, that I think gets at, at Brian's point in a very broad way. So maybe, maybe there's not anything more to say, although Susan and, and Brian, your point that overall, the, the evidence as a whole uh, you know, paints uh, a clearer picture. Maybe that's something we want to bring out here or not. I don't know. Well, we already have a single causality determination that's causal. So I don't think we need to huff a lot about it, you know? It's a, okay. Um, yeah. Okay. So we can move on. <laughs> this is what I think I'm hearing. And so we are, um, now I'd like to see if there's anything else about Appendix 4, which takes us all the way to page 20, line 20. I uh, don't know where it came from, but I have a comment about, uh, in my notes, about 
uh, line 10 through 16. It says, compare with the text on page 27, lines 25 to 30. These two sections are addressing the same question, but provide somewhat different conclusions and rationales for these conclusions. As this is part of the consensus statement, I think it's important to clarify which approach represents the consensus and revise accordingly for internal consistency. Somebody made this comment and I didn't put your name next it's to me. it. It's me, it was me. <laughs> Thank you, Susan. Yeah. So I just, there's just in it, this, this issue comes up twice and it seems like the approach is quite different in those two sections. So I thought it was worth making clearer what we really are recommending or suggesting. Okay. And so what specific changes do we need to make here? So, I mean, I think the specific issue that was being addressed, whether there's the, separation of cardiovascular and sp cause specific mortality from all cause mortality and including a separate section for all, ca all cause mortality. And so I think um, the, <laughs> the consensus on having a section on all cause mortality that's separate and where it should be and how that relates to cardiovascular cause specific mortality, I think was dealt with very differently. Um, and that's not really in our table either. I'm looking at our table and, and so, oh, the effects on other organ systems and mortality. Yeah, yeah, combining with cardiovascular mortality in a new appendix. So that's our current recommendation and that's for a later appendix. Um, so that's sort of what comes up in appendix four, but then in appendix 10, it's more it's harder to figure out what the recommendation or suggestion is. So what? So let's step back and think. What do we want to recommend? Is this so? Uh, is this maybe the clearest statement uh, about what we think we want? Of course, some of us probably need to look at that part of the document too. I mean, I like the way it's written in Appendix Four, but. Um, all right, so maybe we'll revisit this in um, in Appendix 10 uh, or where whatever it is, maybe it was nine. And okay, you're right, it's nine. Sorry. Um, okay, we'll do that. Um, People have stamina to keep going or should we take another short break? We've got another hour. Uh, we've got a lot to cover still. So any, any strong votes for a break? Otherwise I'm gonna keep going. Of course, if you're not chair, you can step out if you're not writing the, a writer of that section and nobody will know, but uh, anyway. All right, so we're... Um, we're on to uh, renal effects. Um, we're, uh, let's see, so we're page 20, uh, line 23, and this one's pretty short, so we'll do the whole thing up to page 21, line 17. And I didn't see any, um, I didn't see any comments come in, but I do note that we do have the, uh, renal effects is a row in our table. And we say, including additional evidence will strengthen the justification for this determination. So we definitely need to be clear about whether that's a recommendation or a, um, or a suggestion. Because as it's worded now, it could be interpreted either way. And I don't know if we need to elaborate more. Bruce. I, I I think it's fine to do it as a suggestion. We're not really changing the causal determination. We're just saying that, and maybe it's in part because of this, they, this is studies that were reviewed after 2013. The study we're recommending provides greater confirmation was earlier than that. But in terms of people reading this, I, I think we would suggest 
that they include this randomized controlled trial. I don't think it needs to be a recommendation, again, because we're not changing the causality determination, but it's a good idea. Okay. And uh, yeah, and Mark, you had some uh, specific comments in the table about the renal effects too. Well, yeah, just that uh, the way it's stated, it wasn't clear what we were suggesting or recommending. And so it either, uh, you know, if, if the specific advice is provided in the text that we can reference that paragraph here, or if it's one additional study, maybe we should cite that study here. Um, but um, if it's already causal, we don't disagree with that. Um, it wasn't clear whether uh, we were, it wasn't clear from this language whether we were asking for more research or uh, adding for suggesting that studies that weren't reviewed should be added. Yeah, um, so I think that our goal is the table will just make clarify, suggest, or recommend, and we'll make it clear in the text that the details are in this specific appendix. And so I guess the question is whether we have enough details to support that suggestion already in the appendix. Um, uh, and uh, um, yeah, so I'm gonna leave it to the people who wrote this chapter to um, help us think about whether we need to strengthen that. And, and so, Mark, I also don't know, was your comment sort of focused on the table or was it focused on the table with along with looking at the appendix text? No, it was really just focused on that one uh, cell in the table in the language that was used there. Okay. It just needs to, needs to be clearer. Okay, so we'll definitely add the word suggest. <laughs> and uh, and point people to the various appendices. And uh, there is some text in the appendix. And Brian, are you going to help us with this too? Yeah, so you, you, you said what I was going to say, Leanne. Um, it's already causal, but my recollection was that you asked at our meeting, Leanne, uh, which studies we felt were, you know, sort of a uh, most uh, motivating. And I think both Bruce and I mentioned the Lynn studies. And, and I think I wrote this little paragraph that's here. So I don't think we need to say a bunch of other stuff because it's all here and the causality and determination is already causal, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's right. That's right. Susan, did you want to add to that? I mean, I think part of the reason this came up though, in response to others' comments, Mark comments, is that there's so much of the literature that's cross-sectional, which is really, really problematic. And then the previous ISA was the basis for questioning causality or the level of causality with renal outcomes. And so there's new cross-sectional data, which is given a fair amount of weight in the ISA. And I think that's problematic. And so part of the reason to highlight this longitudinal study was to provide evidence that was more appropriate for causality determination than a cross-sectional study where you're dealing with renal function, which is a primary excretory pathway for lead. So I think it is it is what it is, but I think you know part of what at least I was responding to in this section is that the ISA perseverated in, in summarizing cross-sectional literature without necessarily acknowledging that it's very problematic for this particular health outcome in terms of causality, because you can't tell the direction of the association. All right, that's helpful. And um, if anyone, it seems like it, the evidence is there. If we want to strengthen that paragraph, I think we, we it wouldn't hurt. Uh, Brian, go ahead. One minor point on line 16 and 17 on page 21. This, the causality determination is already causal. So, um, I, I wrote strengthen the causality determination. I guess it should be strengthen the support for or the evidence for uh -huh. the causality determination. Yes. Okay. Exactly. Because I think in the past, the causality determination was based on weaker evidence. So that's exactly the issue, Brian. Yeah.
Okay, so optionally, we could also strengthen that paragraph, but it sounds like it's got it. We'll certainly make that wordsmith thing edit that will change the meaning. So I think we're ready to move on to um, uh, Appendix 6, the immune system effects. Um, that starts on page 21, line 20 and goes all the way to page 22, line 17. So we'll do the whole immune system effects together. And I wanted to um, note that, uh, remind us that Steve Dutton asked for some clarification. Um, so um, uh, yeah, that the new studies didn't change understanding. Um, and so, oh, exactly what we're talking about uh, with immunosuppression. So um, looking for comments on immune system effects. I can't remember who wrote that. So again, I was summarizing individual comments in our discussion. So I know that's what um, Stephen has asked for clarification about. So I don't know if um, the person who wrote that is here today. Bruce. Well, I didn't write it, but um, I, I think part of the challenge in reviewing this causality determination was that some of the earlier studies that I think drove the EPA's determination weren't included. Now, I, I'm, I haven't read this now for several months, but uh, as I recall, the, the really strong studies, and this is actually back before two, well, for the 2006, 2008 determination were Rodney Dietert's uh, chicken studies, chicken and uh, immunology and chickens. But if you look at the human data, that's where there's a lot of inconsistency. And I think, I don't wanna uh, quote uh, Deborah, but I think that's why Deborah and I both said, the evidence doesn't even seem to be that strong from the human studies. Uh, that most of the human studies I looked at were actually quite weak. Now, if the talk studies were really strong, um, and you could argue that, you know, immunologic studies are challenging because there's so much variability and so many different uh, contributors, that would be a fair statement. But again, I think this struggled with what, what some of us struggled with is some of those earlier studies weren't brought forward to justify that determination. And so I relied more on what I knew about human studies. So maybe maybe Deborah can speak to that as well. Go ahead, Deborah. Yeah, no, I had the same. Uh, I think Bruce and I were on the same page with that. And and again, I agree. If maybe bringing forth some of the uh, other stronger human stuff would um, essentially mitigate our concern and, so and make it read like it was a stronger uh, connection. So were the earlier studies human? I thought they were animal studies. And I'm sorry. Chicken. I think they were mostly chicken, chicken studies that were yeah, really think so. the strong yeah. ones. Okay. So uh, do we want to change our advice from um, uh, suggestive to uh, stronger justification of the likely causal based on the earlier research is needed? Is that what I'm hearing? I think that would be appropriate, yes. Okay. Uh, all right, so that's a different, and, and that's a recommendation, right? Yes. Uh, all right. making sure I'm keeping track of this. Um, all right, anybody else have their hand up? Anything else about this chapter? All right, that's that's very helpful. Uh, okay, so I think we're on to Appendix Seven, hematological effects, and this is on page twenty-two. 
Um, uh, all on page 22, starting on line 20, all the way down to page 23 on uh, six, line six. And we did not have any uh, major changes to suggest and I didn't see any comments. So maybe we can power through that one quickly. Okay, not hearing any, I'm gonna move on to appendix eight, which is also on page, starts on page 23 and goes down to page, uh, the bottom of page 24. So there were a couple of comments on this one and I know EPA was looking for some clarification. So I think this was gonna de uh, deserve some, um, uh, some conversation. Bruce. Yeah, so uh, I'm the one that made the uh, suggestion or recommendation. Um, I raised the question uh, about whether there was sufficient evidence from human studies to conclude that preterm birth and preeclampsia were causally uh, related with lead exposure. And um, I think what Stephen mentioned at the beginning of the day, beginning of this meeting, was that they relied more on heavily on toxicologic studies. So a couple of things I think are, are worthwhile to think about and discuss here. First of all, are there some specific studies that, uh, human studies that provide us with um, greater confidence that, for example, lead might be uh, causally associated with preterm birth. And I pointed to uh, Linda Buey's study from the NASCAR where she showed reductions in NASCAR in an, in an experiment study, uh, reduction in the use of lead uh, during NASCAR races led to a significant reduction in uh, pregnancy outcomes, uh, including preterm birth. And so that gave, gave me a bit more confidence. Um, the other point that I think is worth discussing is the idea of grouping reproductive or pregnancy outcomes as a as a whole, as opposed to looking more specifically at preterm birth, preeclampsia. There have been a couple, um, a couple studies, or excuse me, systematic reviews, meta-analyses of preeclampsia. Um, my read on it, can you still hear me? I had to... Oh, we can't hear Sorry, you. Sorry, I'm having okay. trouble hearing. Bruce, you have suddenly disappeared from your volume or your audio. No, we're not hearing you. Took off your, your headphones and it, did that work? Are, okay, yeah. my, ear, my earbuds are dying, so I took them out and, it, and then everything died. Uh, okay, so um, anyway, so um, the other, the other, evidence was from a systematic review. Now there's been two on preeclampsia where the studies are very consistent uh, showing associations. And so while I do not know the toxicologic evidence, I don't even know if you can look at preeclampsia and, and, and rodents, but I imagine you, you, you can. Um, th those were the reasons that I uh, suggested we consider strengthening the causal determination to cause causality. We've already talked about whether we'd shift this and say something about future determinations should be done for specific outcomes. That's worth discussing as well. Um, anyway, so that's maybe I'll stop there. Yeah, so my notes from what Steve said, his focus, the animal study comments were more for um, the uh, in immunosuppression outcomes. I think for the pregnancy and birth outcomes, it was the concern about separating it out and there would be, I don't, I can't remember how many you said, nine or more separate outcomes if we separated it out. So one way to move this, to navigate this is, would be to say for future, in which case we, like we did for neurodegenerative diseases, in which case we would presumably remove this from the table since it would be a future thing. 
Um, and, and it sounds like you have, um, strong reasons why, why that's supported. And, and the concern that we heard today from Steve Dutton is that there's a lot of outcomes and that need to be addressed separately. Um, he also, I heard him saying that maybe if you weight these outcomes more strongly, the whole category goes to likely causal instead of suggestive is which, where they put it. So that that's a separate thing I think we might want to deliberate on if we wanted to drop the recommending now to um, uh, separate out all the birth um, uh, outcomes into separate categories. So yeah, a couple thoughts. One is um, it really doesn't make sense to me to group these things together. Um, I mean, even you could argue grouping preterm birth as a specific as a global outcome is too crude to look at specific risk factors at, at the same time of course we do it all the time but to group pregnancy outcomes um as one thing makes no sense to me now or in the future having said that i think you know there's some practical issues and 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 those are worth talking about um, I, I guess what I would recommend, though, is we don't really need to look at all nine outcomes if, for most of them, the evidence isn't suggestive, uh, and maybe the focus could only look, for example, at preterm birth and preeclampsia, where there is considerable evidence. And so it's really three outcomes, pregnancy overall, preterm birth, preeclampsia. Okay, Susan. Yeah, I just was going to add a comment that, you know, in our overarching comments for these health appendices, there was some discussion and it's documented that for many outcomes, not just reproductive, there are multiple health measures that go into the overall causality determination. And it's a little unclear how the relative causation or causality determination of each of those outcomes is used to determine an overall causal determination. And I think this is a really prime example of that, where you have a group of measures that have some qualitative relationship, but pathophysiologically may be very distinct. And the causality determinations for each of those measures is very different. And so how does the EPA come up with a global determination? And I think this is a problem, this is a challenge for all the health outcomes to a more greater or lesser degree. Um, and, and, and so it's a much more um, existential question. Um, and, and I don't know what the right approach is, but I agree with you completely, Bruce, that these some of these outcomes shouldn't probably be combined in terms of pathophysiology, but there's a real divergence of their likely causal relationship based on current literature. And how do you address that in a way that's both scientifically appropriate, but also practical? So my so that that thank you Susan for that that clarification and and bringing us to the bigger existential issue and and how to think about it my my sense is from what you all both are saying that if one of these how comes has evidence that it's causal then the category is causal uh, that would be how I would think about it. But that's not um, necessarily how the EPA does it. Well, but we're in a place where we can say <laughs> we get to give our advice. Uh, yeah. So I, I throw that out there as uh, something for people to um, to re react to, because it seems to me like that's a way to address this, this multiple category concern with these outcomes. And if there's one category that's strong enough to say it's causal, why wouldn't that one one sub sub outcome? Why wouldn't it make the whole outcome ca uh, causal? Um, Mark, whoops, what did I do? Yes, I certainly agree that if if um, one category is causal, then that makes the the total conglomeration causal. Um, but um, and maybe we don't need to, um, maybe we can let EPA decide how they want to break things out or not. To me, it's all driven by the question of whether 
some whether we really do think preterm birth and preeclampsia have enough evidence to be classified as, as causal. And, uh, you know, having, I don't know the literature, I can't answer that question. But again, I'd be cautious about saying something's causal based on a few um, even well done epi studies, unless, you know, it, it's really convincing and you really believe there are are minimal remaining uh, weaknesses in the literature. If that's the case, then it, to me, we could suggest maybe breaking out uh, the endpoints for which that we think are uh, causal or even likely to be causal uh, as opposed to suggestive. And then the other one becomes other pregnancy and birth outcomes. That's done in other ISAs for other NAX uh, pollutants. Um, and, but I don't think we need to necessarily prescribe how uh, EPA does that. But I think if they keep them all together and don't want to break any of them out, then the, and we think that those two outcomes are causal, then the whole uh, the pregnancy and birth together becomes causal. Uh, it doesn't make any sense to to do otherwise to me. Okay, thank you for that. It sound, uh, so, so one thing we'll need to do is go back to the overarching place that Susan referred to and, and uh, um, uh, address that unclear how they waited and our advice that if there's something in that uh, multiple outcome category that is causal, that makes the whole category causal. Uh, and that what Mark said is, you know, you either do that or you break that out as something separate and keep everything else lumped together. Um, so that's, that's, I think, point one for the broader question. Uh, and then point two is uh, Mark's um, questioning whether we really have the evidence to recommend these two outcomes are causal which from following through on the advice, if EPA keeps pregnancy and birth outcomes as one bucket, then it becomes causal from suggestive uh, based on, on this discussion. Uh, Susan. Yeah, I mean, I don't want to belabor it, but I, I do think that if, if our recommendation or suggestion is that if you have a large group of outcomes clustered together, and at least one of them is causal, then the entire grouping has to be causal, will be a lot of, it would require a pretty fundamental revision of the ISA, potentially. Well, well I think we're saying two, uh, option one and option two, either op that's option one and option two is to break out that category and put everything else in the other in that grouping. So that would be the alternative. Yeah. Um, I, I think we're not, we're not giving advice that it has to be one or it has to be the other, or at least that's where I'm, what I'm hearing thinking. I, I, um, uh, appreciate, uh, uh, hearing other perspectives. Bruce. Yeah, and I guess just to uh, speak uh, to Mark Frampton's comment, um, it, it isn't clear from the ISA whether pregnancy and reproductive outcomes should be causal, or let's say more specifically preterm births and preeclampsia, because the focus, the review was, was inadequate. Uh, so I can't say here that I can tell you my read on the epi literature. Uh, systematic reviews have found that lead consistently is a risk factor for preeclampsia. The evidence is very consistent from lower level exposures uh, with preterm birth, including natural experiment studies like the NASCAR. Um, and so the evidence is quite clear. Can I say that from ISA? the draft ISA, no, because they didn't, they didn't review the evidence sufficiently to draw any conclusions of causality. Does that mean there is or there is not? No, it just means they didn't review it uh, sufficiently. They just sort of looked at the weight of the evidence, I suppose. Um, having said all of that, it is a lot of work. I think there's, there's again, practical issues, pragmatic issues, and then there's, um, questions about how this 
maybe should be done in the future. And just as we talked about with neurodegenerative disease, if there is growing evidence, consistent evidence of an association of lead and a specific outcome, then that should be pulled out separately. Uh, and certainly to me, the evidence is, if not causal, close to causal. <clears throat> and um, maybe it's a missed opportunity this time to have the evidence reviewed, but certainly that should be done in the future. And certainly the evidence, if it's not causal, is very close to being causal from the epi literature. I can't speak to the tox literature. So maybe what uh, we do instead for these particular outcomes is uh, um, recommend a more careful consideration of those outcomes in the ISA with consideration of upgrading them and therefore the whole category to likely causal or causal. Uh, it sounds like, and then in the future, uh, also address these more careful. But if we say consider that, uh, given it sounds like the workload is a big consideration. So whether it actually gets done in this one versus the next one, sounds like that's, uh, does that, does that uh, speak to what you were saying, Bruce? I, I'm fine with that. I, I would say that I was very careful about including these specific references uh, a year ago in our first meeting uh, so that there was ample time to incorporate them. Uh, at the same time, I, you know, I, I'm very aware that this is a lot of work. So I'm, I'm willing to go along with whatever the consensus of the group is and focus well, on the future. Uh, I I don't know if if you included those references a year ago and they weren't adequately vetted in the uh, ISA when we had the then I think that that we just asked for it <laughs> frankly <laughs> I, that, that's our recommendation it's not like it, it's not like this is like oops <laughs> this is like okay we provided this in our review of the IRP that you said this was important these comments were made then I think it's okay to recommend that that literature be looked at more carefully. I, I in my opinion, I, I, I welcome other input and I see a couple of hands up. Uh, uh, so go ahead, Phil. Yeah, uh, this seems like an important kind of um, change in tone a little bit in the suggestions and recommendations. My uh, just um, quick uh, recommendation for uh, you, Susan, and the group, um, is that I think that the summary table um, will probably get a lot of attention. You know, that that's a really helpful table to have and to the extent that we can kind of work in this nuance, um, you know, in, in what we're recommending or suggesting in the table itself as well um, could be really helpful. So just, just a thought. Yeah, so we should decide. You're absolutely right. We need to decide how we're going to revise the table I, I, and, and some of these details. Uh, Susan, you have your hand up. Maybe you're going to help us with this. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I, I like what you said before, Leanne. I think that I think that that one recommendation or suggestion that could come out of this is that in the future, when putting together an ISA, that um, these broad health outcomes outcome categories are very helpful structurally, but maybe there needs to be another level of analysis um, that allows each broad category to be looked, the components of each broad category to be looked at individually um, in ways that are a little more granular than what is currently done. Um, because I think increasingly, as we appreciate sort of the different pathophysiology and um, underlying mechanisms of some of these health disorders, um, exposure relationships are going to be more nuanced and looking at more granular categories of disease is going to be helpful. But logistically and from a pragmatic point of view, having these broad categories is also important. So in a way, recommending that they do a little bit of both, which is probably not what Stephen, you know, it's not, it's a lot, perhaps it's more work, but I think it's also more informative. And that would apply not just to um, reproductive health outcomes, but to all of them. 
Yeah, so I'd like us, and maybe I can work with you on this, Susan, to think about how we can address our broad uh, recommendations on uh, the sort of relative groupings uh, idea. And I think we've had a couple of different thoughts here. Uh, and I like your idea of sort of doing a little bit of both um, and, and articulating that. And also how uh, us giving, as I said a little earlier, us giving advice about um, particularly the causal, we haven't really addressed the other categories, but maybe the idea is the highest in the rank ordering of causality, the outcome that drives it, it drives the whole category, that that would be our recommendation. And uh, or that that it becomes the reason why that outcome gets split out from the rest, one or the other, uh, and that's for EPA to decide. So that that keeps the structural broad grouping uh, as simple as possible, but allows for this separate pathophysiology to drive uh, the most important causal conclusions. So that's the broad thing. And then um, we still need to, as Phil said, we still need to make sure that we're clear about how we're gonna revise the table. And I guess I'm not 100% clear yet for the pregnancy and birth outcomes, how we're gonna navigate it. Sounds like we're going to back off on uh, the current advice for separate determinations for each component, sort of consistent with this overarching uh, approach that we articulated. Um, and then, um, but then we're going to also ask for um, an in-depth review of, uh, as opposed to saying separate out preterm birth and preeclampsia is, is causal, I think we're asking based on the, the input that uh, Bruce gave with the IRP, we're asking for uh, more in-depth uh, review uh, that may lead to an upgrading of uh, these outcomes to uh, causal or likely causal. And we'll leave it to EPA to do that as opposed to being prescriptive. Um, so I think that's probably what our advice is on this table. Does that sound right to people? I see Bruce shaking his head, yes. And I see Brissa has her hand up, so she's gonna help us. Yeah, I wonder, I, uh, for all the physicians in the room, please forgive me. But I wonder if for this pregnancy and birth outcomes, if um, if a, se a separation of these could be made by thinking about kind of what's happening to the to the mother uh, versus what eventually happens to the child. So preeclampsia and preterm birth are processes about the mother. Whereas birth weight uh, I, 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 are, are, set, are more about the child. Of course, with preterm birth, it's also the child was born prematurely. But um, I wonder if, if delineations around that could be somewhat helpful, maybe artificial, but um, anyway, just thought. Susan. Yeah, I mean, I think rethinking the broad categories is I think what you're suggesting based on a sort of a priori set of principles. Um, but I think it gets tricky, right? Even preeclampsia is about the baby because it it's about placental function and placental vascular function, presumably, which is very much related to the baby. So I think that particular example is, is difficult, but I think the principle of thinking about ways to regroup outcomes using some other prior uh, a priori grouping uh, motivation is a really nice one. I'm just not sure <laughs> how to operationalize that. Is that something we need to add to the report, this idea? I mean, it would be a suggestion if we did add it. Yeah, I mean, I think it fits well with this whole notion of how do you deal with multiple outcome categories that, you know, rethinking the 
the principles that are currently being used are based on sort of, you know, ICD non or ICD diagnostic categories or something. Maybe there's more creative and more functionally relevant ways to do this. Um, okay. But that's so a very kind of hypothetical suggestion because I can't tell you exactly how to do it. So we can put it as a suggestion in this whole overarching comment that we're uh, editing anyway. Uh, and uh, just leave it to EPA to maybe come up with some new uh, new approaches, but not that we're telling them that they need to do that, but just to consider that in the future. Um, Mark. Yeah, I would caution about going too far in that direction. I think there's a reason uh, for continuing to use uh, uh, recognized diagnostic terms um, as outcomes rather than trying to group outcomes in ways that because the the you know most of the epi, most of the epidemiology is is dealing with um, known diagnoses and known outcomes um, medically speaking. So if we try to categorize these outcomes in a, an untraditional way, uh, I see it as creating more problems than it solves. Um, so I'm not sure that we want to go in that direction. And I think the advice would be just consider whether it's a path worth following. And you may have just articulated why it's not a path that should be followed. Uh, Susan. Yeah, I mean, I think there, that was in my, there, this suggestion has nothing to do with, with um, diagnostic categories, right? Preterm birth would still be preterm birth. Preeclampsia would still be preeclampsia. So it's not the conventional way of identifying pathology would still be very much a fundamental part of it. The question is, you know, should preterm birth also go with um, endometriosis? Like it, it, it's a question of what, what do you, what particular categories of outcomes group well together, but based on recognizable diagnostic categories. I don't think anybody's advocating for not continuing to do that for obvious reasons. So I think it's more a function of, you know, how do you come up with these global constructs that maybe are more um, efficient for purposes of, of trying to understand causality? Okay, uh, I wanna bring us back to the reproductive and developmental effects and make sure that we've got, um, uh, we've addressed all the comments. I see there were a couple from Brian Schwartz, but I think the one was about the lead categorization, which we've discussed. Um, um, and then there was a comment on page 23, uh, point number three. Do you want, Brian, did you want to uh, bring that up? Uh, that you were asking whether there was evidence that lead causes changes in body weight or adiposity um, and uh, putting more details into number three. Yeah, so I don't have my comments open. I have the uh, letter open. Um, should I try to find it? Um, well, it, sure, we can, uh, we can come back to you. Um, I, I copied people's comments into my version so that I could remember to not skip things. Um, uh, yeah, so, and maybe I got something. Oh, maybe, yeah. It's in the full document. Brian, if you, if you, you're, you have Leanne's letter open. Yeah. Yeah, if you, if you, the letter is a long document that includes all the consensus statements. So if you just scroll down, you'll find it. There you go. Oh, Brian, thank you, Aaron. Oh, That's that, cool. I don't, do I have that document? Uh, yes, Aaron sent, so you sent a document to Aaron uh, with comments uh, in advance of the meeting, which was super helpful. And Aaron made these public. Uh, and he, of course, he puts his own uh, like line numbers on it and things like that. So we're talking about point G. 
page 23, uh, lines 40 and forward, uh, you asked the question, and I wanted to make sure we addressed um, that. Um, yeah, I mean, I think that was my question. Um, <laughs> I, th I think uh, I am not really um, aware of compelling evidence about these issues with lead. So should so we- So page 23, line 40. 40, yeah. So it's point number three that starts on line 40. Should we edit that point? That I think is the, the operational question uh, based on your comment. Susan. So, yeah, I mean, um, so the purpose of this particular item was to identify areas in the ISA in which things were labeled as confounding when in fact they weren't confounders. So I think that's the fundamental principle. And it sort of goes back to what Mark Frampton was talking about, you know, like, what are the real limitations of this literature that was reviewed? And if one of the limitations is confounding, then it's important to be sure that it really is confounding. So these were meant to be examples of limitations related to confounding that were actually not related to confounding. Um, so in terms of lead and body composition, I mean, there's very good literature that early lead exposure is associated with shorter stature in children. And there is some evidence, including research that I've done, that lead exposure is associated with changes in body composition and weight in children. So, um, so, so I think, um, and because especially for menarche, more so than for male pubertal development, because weight and body mass index are important contributors to age at menarche. If you have a relationship between lead and BMI, it's more likely a causal intermediate than a confounder. So that's where this came from. I mean, if you want, if, if you feel like it needs to be- um, is, it, is it just, you know, your studies, is the body of evidence about this point, um, several different groups, several different populations, uh, several different designs. I mean, th this is exactly my point. You said causal intermediate and I, I just. Well, maybe, maybe studies, causal intermediate is the wrong word. About. Maybe it's like, um, uh, maybe I shouldn't say causal, but that it's, you know, sort of uh, a mediator. It's a mediator, which means As it's, opposed, it's causal. Well, yeah, I mean, I think um, we can take, I, I, I'm not, um, not sure it's worth doing a whole new literature search on this, but I think the, the key principle of this paragraph which I have, which I've agreed with since since you've been saying this even at the yeah moment. yeah I it's just to demonstrate that that sometimes in the ISA factors were were identified as confounders and studies were identified as having limitations because these confounders weren't considered when in fact they were inter they were mediators and although it's <clears> important <throat> to think about mediators for other reasons it doesn't represent the same source of bias as a confounder does so that's the purpose of this paragraph and I the totally specific agree. examples that we use we can simplify the examples if that's um, the most expeditious way to do it I totally that's agree all. with your point but but the way it's written is it it makes the reader ask the question oh is lead causally related to adiposity so it sounds like the straightforward thing to do is- Just take out the example. Okay. Uh, so we'll just remove the example. That's the simple thing. Uh, okay, so that's just deleting a sentence, I think is what we're talking about. All right. Um, Anything else on this appendix? We've got 10 more minutes. Any chance we can get through the last two appendices on health? We'll see. Um, and we'll come back to whatever we need to on tomorrow. So we're on to appendix nine. That is uh, starting on page 25 of uh, and then moving through to uh, midway through page 27. 
and there were um, uh, there were a couple of things I have flagged. Uh, Brian, you it was you didn't on line eighteen. You didn't like the word half residence time. There's probably a simple wordsmithing change that we could uh, talk about. Maybe just clearance half times that would solve that one. On this is on page twenty five, line eighteen. Uh, and I'm partly lack of time. I'm moving through here more quickly on page 26. On point six, which starts on line seven, I added the, the last sentence. The case act recommends that these be added. I just wanted to make sure that that was appropriate. We noted that the health outcomes were not covered and um, do we want them added or should that be in the future? Um, is it important to do that now? What, what, what is our advice? If we note that our outcomes weren't covered, what are we, what are we advising? Um, and we're pointing it out. What are we, what are we telling the case uh, the EPA to do? Bruce. Well, may, maybe it's, Maybe it is pointing out that these need to be um, followed more closely in the future. I, I know that there's certainly more studies out there on lead and tooth decay that weren't included. There's another one that might be coming out soon. Um, and, and I so I guess it's really about trying to give the EPA heads up. I, I don't think we're going to make any causality determinations on cataracts or tooth decay today. But I think it's it's maybe just trying to flag that there are some studies that the EPA should be looking out in the future um, for future ISAs. Okay, so we're talking about in future ISAs. Okay, thank you. Um, Mark Weisskopf, you had a suggestion on, on line 18, number eight for rewording the sentence that starts with however. You yeah, this was, <clears throat> this was sort of a, this is a same comment from before about interactions. <clears throat> this is the same thing basically being said. So I was just adding a par parenthetical at the end saying relative to the association of the more vulnerable group, just to use the same terminology as above. Okay, great, thank you. Anything else on, Oh, uh, we do have, and we may, since it may need some further uh, dealing with, we do have on page 27, lines 25 to 30, this is the text that Susan brought up that um, that uh, is, is said in two different places. And Susan mentioned that she liked the cardiovascular disease text. So I think I'm going to flag this for coming back to tomorrow, given we only have a couple minutes left. I don't think we have time to vet this now, but uh, anyone who cares to look at this in more depth, uh, 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 re I think we'll come back to this tomorrow uh, because I'm hoping we might get through health today. Uh, so we have on, uh, we're now on the, unless there's anything else on chapter appendix nine, I suggest we move to appendix 10, which is um, uh, starts on page 27, line 33, and goes through page 28, line 23. And I don't have anything flagged that anybody brought to my attention. Okay, this has been a long meeting with only one short break. Uh, I, I don't know about the rest of you, but I'm getting pretty tired. So I, I think it's time to uh, I think it's time to call it a day. Uh, we have um, so what some next steps for tomorrow. There were some various things that I asked people to weigh in on, and um, if you could, um, if there's anything that you think needs to be vetted in public. 
uh, if you could um, give Aaron and I a heads up to make sure we don't drop it uh, tomorrow, I really super appreciate that. If you have proposed text um, uh, to to bring up tomorrow, then um, uh, then that would be awesome. I realize we have lives and we have a lot of other things going on, so people may or may not have time uh to do that but we do need to vet any major changes the other thing that i will do is uh i will work with aaron to come up with a um a revised version of the table so we can all look at that tomorrow before we end the um health stuff uh and uh, mar uh, excuse me bruce you have your hand up just wanted a question of clarification. So if we had, for example, a sentence that we've revised that we were assigned, uh, send that to you and Aaron this afternoon? Well, if it's a sentence that you think needs deliberating in public because the sentiment was not already conveyed in our conversation, then yes. <laughs> if it's something that the sentiment was clearly conveyed adequately that we can address this offline as more like wordsmithing. And so we did have one, I did ask Aaron for one clarification earlier. So as a, so that was an example where he said, oh, the, the, you know, we have enough, we can edit this offline. So I'm talking about the things that we really need to vet in public. So any changes in causal determinations that weren't clearly stated today, that clearly is something that needs to get out. I think we have it with the reproductive outcomes, but when we look at the revised table, we will hopefully know that. Um, and I see Mark Weisskopf has his hand up because I did ask him to write a paragraph and that might be one that ideally we would look at tomorrow. Right. So that was my first question is whether we had come to the conclusion that, that we still needed that. And, and I guess the answer is yes. And then well, my recollection is that it would be really helpful to have that overarching paragraph. Yes. And, and just so I'm clear, this is sort of a suggested we are suggesting such a paragraph to add to the ISA. Is that what we're saying? Oh, gosh. I'm sorry, it's been a long meeting. I'm not really completely. I think we were suggesting a paragraph we were going to write to our overarching comments that was more about the broad implications of effect modification. Wasn't that what you were going to uh, do? Uh, not effect modification. No, it was, it was sort of about this issue of bone lead and different oh, departments right. of bone and what it reflects. But so are we, I guess that's where I was unclear, is whether we're, we're, we're making a statement that the EPA ought to take these, write something at the beginning of the health sections about this, or I, I don't know, Susan or Brian, if you can help me with where. I, I thought we decided that the general stuff that was in the ISA already was adequate. And, mm -hmm. and in our letter, all we need to do is if we use the term bone lead in reference to a specific finding in a specific study, we should specify the bone that was measured. In, you mean in our letter we should do that, or we should say that the EPA should be doing that in the ISA? I thought all we were doing was talking about the letter today. Ah. As well, but maybe you have both comments, Mark. You want us to be clearer in our letter on our specific comments, but you're also suggesting that we advise EPA to be clearer as well. Is that what you're saying? Yeah, because I thought, I mean, Brian, your original comment was referencing language in the ISA, correct? Or not, or am I, did I get that wrong? No, it was about the letter. Ah, ah, I see. Okay. okay. Now, I thought we weren't allowed to keep going back to the ISA, but if there's a lot of reference to bone lead in the ISA, I think that's I think that's not good. But I was mainly referring to the use of the term bone lead in our letter because I okay. thought we couldn't go back. Got it. So, so we can. So, a couple of things about our advice: if we, by the end of tomorrow, deliberate in public, you know, about changes to the ISA that can be included. <laughs> it has to be done in public. Also, the EPA pays careful attention to all of our individual comments. So if you individually see, for instance, examples where the ISA is unclear 
about the reference to the type of lead and you think it should be clearer, you are more than welcome. And I think encouraged, I'm sure the EPA would appreciate this, encouraged to put those details in your individual comments. They do not need to be vetted in public. And you are welcome to update your individual comments. So that is an opportunity to help improve the, the ISA without deliberating in public. Now, I, I realize that none of us are planning on rereading the ISA in its entirety at this late stage. But you know, if there's things that you have already identified or things that you wanna make stronger based on our conversation, I would strongly encourage that. Uh, and you can do that in your individual comments. Um, uh, so Mark, my, my mind's a little bit fuzzy on what we asked you to do. So if my notes and errands come together and it's something we think we need to vet in public, we'll get back to you on that. And hopefully either, at least if we get the thrust of the idea, if you can't, don't have time to put together a paragraph, don't worry about it. <laughs> the thrust of the idea we might need to come back to. We may have covered it. I just, I, I, right now I can't. So, so what I have was Mark was supposed to draft some intro text uh, regarding bone lead reflecting different exposure window, but that kind of went out the, you know, the, then once Brian clarified what he wanted, then I think that nullified the need for that. Yeah, I think if we could, we could easily go through the letter and find wherever we reference bone lead and be more specific. Yeah, which we are planning to do. And we can do that offline. We don't need to deliberate on that. We agreed on that. So we don't need to deliberate on all those wordsmithing changes. We didn't, do need to look for them and fix it before we make this final, but that's not tomorrow. Okay. Uh, so is everybody clear on next steps? I think there were some appendix one slash two. Um, again, I'm a little fuzzy that we might need to revisit. And again, I'll leave it to those uh, lead authors to uh, use their judgment and feel free to ask Aaron and I to weigh in on whether uh, anything needs to be deliberated on that we talked about uh, to come back to tomorrow. So we'll definitely revisit the table and we'll revisit that uh, paragraph that Susan identified that we skipped over in uh, Appendix 9. And uh, I think we'll call it a day. So um, do I recess this, Aaron, or you recess us? Oh, wait, Kathy has a comment first. Well, I just was um, gonna add to the revisiting things. Uh, do you want the amendments that I'm going to be sending on appendix two to be revisited or not? I I think I heard that you had vetted in public sufficiently the intent, which is what matters. And so the details of exactly how it's worded can be crafted offline, as okay. long as the intent is clear. Okay. Um, yes, thank you for clarifying that. All right, Aaron, I guess you you close the meeting or recess the meeting. Okay, we can be recessed till tomorrow, uh, same time, 11 o'clock uh, a.m. Eastern time. We'll see you all tomorrow. Thank you for all your hard work today.